Hello and welcome to episode 524 of Fergo on the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can follow me on Twitter at AndrewRLP. Join me as always as the glorious League Freak. You can also find me on Twitter at League Freak. How are you going there, mate? I'm going pretty well, Andrew. I uh, I just want to make it clear that nothing weird is going on. And uh, anybody that says anything weird's going on, I'll take them to court. Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds fair. Yeah, because yeah, there's I, I, there's nothing weird going on. No, 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 everything is as per normal. Yeah, yeah, like I I usual. know what you think you saw, but no, 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 going on. No, no, I I I know what I saw. Yeah, I, yeah, and what I saw is what I think I saw, but and did. something something bad's going on, but it's not. No, no, actually right. doing a charity thing. Look, look thing. like something else. Doing some charity work. That's all. Yeah. Uh, what sort of charity work do you think it was? Not really sure. Uh, but you know, I was doing it. That's the important thing. Yeah. My allergies are playing up high. I was going to say, have you have you tried some some of that Vicks? <sighs> it's just I, I don't know what it is. It's just oh, it's my nose. It's just really irritated at the moment. Yeah. I I think there's a possibility I've done too much charity work. You know what I mean? You, you've overindulged in the charity work. He, well, I, when I do, listen, when I do charity work, I fucking go hard. Okay. You, 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 so, you fully commit, fully commit. Uh, yeah. So I've done so much charity work lately and I know they say you shouldn't do too much charity work, but I like to push the boundaries of what's physically possible. Do you get do you get uh, lungs deep in charity work? Pretty much, yeah. Like, I think that's, you you what you like you you've got so much charity work. It, it's actually part of the air that you breathe. Charity work to the point where like my my face goes numb and my tongue goes numb and everything. My nose, heaps of charity work. And that must that must give you an absolute. Um, Sense of euphoria doing that much good deeds for the for the uh, for the public. Yeah, I want to start talking to people about like starting businesses and shit when I do too much charity work. Yeah, what, what sort of businesses? Cafes. Yeah, lots of cafe stuff. Yeah. Um, it imports and exports. Ooh, they're big. Hey, you, you've got to be careful yeah. though. You got to be careful. Yeah, yeah. There, careful. There's um. There's, there's a father of a player who's going to do a little bit of trouble there. Yes. Allegedly. 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 <laughs> let's, talk about uh, the, let's talk about the biggest disgrace that has happened in rugby league. Okay. Yeah, Trent Barrett is now coaching again. Fucking disgraceful, isn't it? <laughs> it's horrible. It's fucking horrible. Like, in it, look, in our wildest dreams, we all hoped that one day Trent Barrett would step into that Parramatta role, but we didn't think it would happen. But after the Eels sack Brad Arthur, Trent Barrett is now once again the man in charge at an NRL club. And, uh, like, I mean, you've got to give his manager credit. His manager must be fucking amazing, hey? Or Braithen Astor. Is it Braithen Astor? Is that his manager? I mean, I, I doubt it, but I mean... It... It probably is at the same time. <laughs> it, it, it would just be such a perfect partnership. It would be. It's, uh, yeah. I just it's, can't wait till we see, like, Parramatta down by 40 points again and we see, like, that dumb, soulless look once <laughs> more on a head coach. I just can't wait. I'm really I'm pumped for it, actually. It, it's... Oh... I think my problem with the Trent Barrett appointment is it's one of those appointments that you just want to hear being made at the end of a season. So you've got a full off season to just prepare yourself for the untold miseries about to completely dump on the team. Um, I don't know. I, I like just being thrown into the mix where like, you know, we get to that point of the season, it's kind of just before origin. There's a lot of players that are injured at the moment. And it just, I think having Trent Barrett there has reinvigorated me, I know, mid-season. So. Well, just look, the, 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 it's a pro and a con at the same time. So mm-hmm. the, 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 the con is, um, 
other than Barrett himself as a coach, is, yeah. is the fact that he can use this year as an excuse to mm. justify the poor performances that will happen with Parramatta. The pros is, because he can use this excuse, there's a fair chance he can put himself in the pole position to be coached again next year. Imagine if they... <laughs> like, the, the most Parramatta thing in the world, right, would be that they get a few of their players back over the next month or so, they start winning a few games, and then Parramatta immediately gives him, like, a four-year deal. That would be the most Parramatta thing ever. Um, I, I, I like... Agree. I was going to say, can I read out a, a brief conversation that um, a, a mate of mine down here in Victoria who casually watches rugby league? Yeah. The thing and I had. Very yeah. brief. And this was at, um, at 6.04 p.m. He sends me a text message. Brad Arthur sacked. I'll just reuse someone. Um, you know, they've, they've ended funding and struggling again, so someone's going to make the switch. And I replied a minute later... I'll get some hack coach like Trent Barrett or Jason Taylor or some former club man. Yeah. And then he says, call it on Barrett. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, my only response is, well, I'm a rugby league expert according to the National Rugby League. <laughs> they I were not that mine. The, uh, cause they were trying to get Bennett and it sounds like the, the meeting that they had with Wayne Bennett was Wayne Bennett literally saying to them, no. I really am not going to sign for your club. I'm already going to South. Um, he's probably yeah, ready, he, probably ready says, hey, Wayne, uh, you know, we've got a job here going at the Paramount you know, Football Club. Do you want to come in and be coach? He says, you know what? I've actually already agreed to go and coach the Dolphins, the Broncos, the Titans, the Tigers, <laughs> and the Bunnies next year. So it's a, it's a no, sorry. I don't have time. Yeah. <laughs> the, I feel like, I mean, if they don't stick with Barrett, because the thing is, they've sacked Arthur, and it feels like there's not really anyone out there that is a giant upgrade. So if they don't stick with Barrett, which I kind of hope they will, because just for the entertainment value, if they get someone like a Nathan Brown, <laughs> which would be just <laughs> as hilarious. Well, I mean, um, I mean we, should, we should go through the options. There's Stephen Kearney. No. No? No. But you reckon Trevor Barrett over Kearney? I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, who else have we got? Oh, your old mate. Who? Former Panthers coach. Oh, Matthew Elliott. Dude. Like, yeah. I would take hey. Matthew Elliott over uh, Trent Barrett. Still there. Yeah. I can get him there. Yeah. Um, or they'll probably go with a former Parramatta player. But who? Oh, it doesn't matter who. I mean, Christ, if Trent Barrett can get a coaching gig, anyone can. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I, how did, about Jim How Dimmick. about John Morris? John Morris did he play? Yeah, he did play for Parramatta, didn't he? He did quite a bit, and he's at the uh, he's at the West Tigers as an assistant coach. He'd be a good option. Uh, Jim Dimmick, he's been an mm-hmm. assistant coach in a number of places for a long time. He's probably Jason, due for a... Jason Taylor. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. If we're if we're honest, mm. because they do have a bit of an aging roster, and I, I'll I'll check their their contracts and stuff, but mm. because they do have a bit of an aging roster, I I don't think they'd have too many players on long term um, deals there. So mm. maybe the best person you get in there is someone who actually knows how the hell to run a team. Mm-hmm. Michael McGuire. Well, I thought Mick Potter. Actually, no, no, Mick Potter is a very, very good suggestion as well because, yeah, and as we know, the one thing he will do immediately is he will fix up the defence. Mm-hmm. Um, so at the moment, they've got, yeah, not many options, <laughs> to be honest. They've got Zach Lomax signed up to 2028. Um, yeah. Will penasini has got a player option for 2026. Sean Lane has a mutual option in 2026. Madison, 2026, has a player option. Moses is signed to 2026 with a player option until 2028. Marcus Sivo has an option for 2026. Junior Paulo, 2026. Dylan Brown, is signed to 2025, but he's got a player option to take him up to 2031. Fuck, I wonder if that's a year-on-year thing or if it's a... It, it like... looks like it might be, but those are the only ones... 
Yeah. Those are the only players with contracts currently on the table for them to stay at the club after mm. 2025. So mm. that means next year they are going to be having a massive clean out. Mm. Whether, whether they want to or not, it's just going to happen. You can't have that many players off contract and not have a massive clean out of players. So what better than to just let Barrett see out the season? Yeah. Maguire in there for 2025. He gets to set up everything once in place. He's already got a roster for that year. But knowing that by the end of that first season, he's going to have an absolute, I'll use the term, war chest. <laughs> and he can go out and buy whatever he wants to build whatever team he wants immediately, which is an option that he never got at the West Tigers. Here, he'll have that, bam, straight away. He's only got like five or six players signed on for 2026, and that's it. And some of those are just yeah. options. So if he doesn't want them, he can let them go as well. Well, that, like the thing I, because I did a post about what I would do, and, and I said Mick Potter, but yeah, like Mike McGuire would just be as good. Um, and I said I'd get rid of Gutherson, because I think that you can see with Gutherson out, they've got that young bloke at the fullback spot who's, you know, it, it for the start of his career, he's shown a, quite a bit already. Um, and he's shown what it's like when you've got a fullback that runs the ball. It's kind <laughs> of revolutionary, you know. But if they could get rid of Gutherson, and then, I mean, the problem is a lot of those guys, and we've talked about it before, they committed long-term deals to guys that, if you were very, very kind, you could say have proven that they can't get over the hump of winning things. Um and they they stuck with them. They committed to that entire team, and it's it's been a failure, you know. And so they've got to look at a different direction. And it's funny when you point that out, like I pointed it out online, and there was a few Parramatta fans that were like, hey, "We can't get rid of him. We can't get rid of him." And it's like, "We'll just stick, stay the course, see how that goes." Then, um, but it's clear that they've got to make some changes. I think that. When you sign guys that haven't really won too much at the very peak of their careers to long-term deals, when those guys start coming away from the peak of their careers, this is what you get. Uh, I'd stick with, I think you could get rid of a lot of guys, have Moses and Brown there, although Brown needs to step it up. But if you have Moses and Brown, at least you've got like a foundation of something you can work around. Um, but yeah, it's like, it's a good job. They've got a good junior system there. It's not fantastic, but it's good. And hopefully they get the right dude for the job. I'd, but with it being Parramatta, I just wouldn't be shocked if they get a name and the names that are out there for the most part would be dreadful. Like I've heard that uh, Jason Rolls is another name that's out there. I don't know about that. Um, you know, that, you never know how these guys are going to go until they've had a head coaching role, but there's plenty of guys out there that have had a head coaching role that we know can't get the job done. So I hope they don't choose one of those guys. Yeah. I mean, I'm just looking at their roster at the moment. These are the players they've got at the moment who are age 28 or older. So by this time next year, they're going to be 29 plus. Mm. Uh, Makahisi, Makatoa, Regan Campbell-Gillard, they're both 31. Mike Acevo, Junior Paulo, they're both 30. Gutherson, Moses, Madison, Cartwright, and Sean Lane are all 29. Offa and Gowie, Joey Lussick, both 28. Yeah. That's a big, big core mm. of their uh, regular run on side. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if nearly all of those people are gone by 2026. When, you know, at the start of the 2026 season, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, they've got plenty of young guys that are coming through below them there, and I think it's time for for a clean out there because they, the year they made it to the grand final, that was the last year of their premiership window, and we said that at the time, and I didn't expect them to drop off this rapidly, much like South. Mm -hmm. I mm. thought South would be a hell of a lot better than they are this year. My God, they are dreadful. Um, and, yeah, at the moment, the Par Parramatta and South, so far this year, are the two worst second-half teams in the competition. Mm -hmm. And oddly mm -hmm. enough, Parramatta has conceded more points in the second half than South this year. But, it's only, by, but it's only by one point. 
193 That's... to 192, but it is nuts. I think the thing with Parramatta too is that like you had this team that was at its absolute peak. The players were at the peak of their careers and stuff and that they come into that grand final. They were so confident and like Penrith really like crushed them. And it's, it sounds cliched, but like you, you go into a grand final and it's over 20, like 35 minutes in, you know, it, like over, over. Yeah, and the way it was over too, they got absolutely blasted. It it's hard to come back from that as any team, but it's much harder when you're you're at your best and you're at the peak and this is it for you, or it's probably it for you, and you know that happens. That's why I've been really impressed with the Broncos this year, like. They had what happened to them in the grand final and they've come back, but they're a younger, they're a much younger team, much, mm-hmm. much younger team. And they look fantastic. I've loved watching them this year. They look fantastic, but they've got, like, most of them have 10 years left in their careers. It's a Parramatta team when they lost the grand final the way they did, their peak of the, a lot of those guys career was like three or four years at best. And it's a different prospect for them. And, they need to get out of that whole idea of like stick and stay the course because it's been a real bad one for them. And, you know, everyone else has seen the, the problems that they've had, but they've been too starry eyed about their own players that to be willing to make changes. And it's cost them. It's just, it's let's, really cost let's them. be honest. The absolute moment that everything went pear shaped for Parramatta was the day they let Reed Mahoney go. Well, like, it's weird because he shouldn't have been a make or break player for that team. No, of course not. But when you look like at who they been. replaced him with and the impact yeah. that had, yeah. not, not just the fact they signed Hodgson, because he was capable of still being a serviceable NRL player, but he got injured and had to retire so early on that the whole plan they had to cover for Mooney was completely out the window before the season even ended. But the, the, first but the thing was... The thing was too, like when as soon as they signed him, you and me were like, "This is going to end in a disaster." And when he was playing, like we were saying, like the things he's doing on the field is not what the Eels need. And it was just a really bad signing. And like, well, he was also so much slower than he was at Canberra, and that was part of like the, the well, one S that he had was he was very quick getting the ball off the deck to the first receiver. And that was gone when he was at Paramount. He was so slow to get the get the ball, get it off the ground, and then get it out. And so yeah. the defense was already cutting down Paramount's attacking plays. And so mm-hmm. they adopted this stupid one-dimensional process where and it was because that's all they could do at the time was kick to the corners. Mm-hmm. And it worked for a little bit. But people eventually, teams will eventually figure it out pretty quickly, and they did. And they did, yeah. It, it, like, it, and it's weird. Like, as I said, it, Reed Marnie shouldn't have been the breaking point for the club. Um, they still had basically everyone else. That's the thing. Um, and and it, it's a strange one. I mean, it's not even like you can look at Reed Marnie at the Bulldogs and say, wow, he's been amazing for them. He's oh. been okay for them. He's been really pretty patchy at times. He's been costly to them at times, even. Um, and, and I, I think it just shows that this was a team that it was at probably at the very edge of what it was ever going to achieve. And, you know, it, it's cost them going this far. Whether I don't think Sack and Brad Arthur is going to change too much for them. Like, that's not what I look at this team and thought immediately, like, oh, the first thing that needs to happen is change the coach. But at the same time, when you've been there for 11 years and results turn the wrong way, and the person that signed this team up to long-term deals, including the coach recently, when the board goes to him and says, what's the problem? That person can't say, oh, it's me. I fucked up here. They've got to say, well, it's obviously the coach. He's been here for too long. So that's why Brad Arthur's been the one that's copped it. But we'll see who they get in. I, I really do just hope they get the right person and not a name. And I, I think that they'll get a name. So it's worth noting too, Brad Arthur's coaching record, 51.9% success rate over 264 games. 
Um, Jason Demetrio, 51.7. Anthony mm-hmm. Griffin, 51.1. Um, Ricky Stewart, 50.5. Who else have we got on there is a bit of a uh, marker. Um, Tim Sheens, 49.6%. It's just underneath. Uh, trying to think of a coach like... Think of a Adam coach o- that's... Look, Adam, o- Adam O'Brien, 46.7. Seabold, 46.5. Todd Payton, 48. Who's a coach that's above that level of coaching? Not, like, not looking at the, the like percentages, but who's a, a coach that's above that level of coaching but obviously isn't Bennett Bellamy and I dare, I, like you have to put Ivan Cleary in there just because of what he's done? Um, it, Mal, Mal Meninga, 52.8. Uh, Michael Hagen, 53.2. What about Jeff Tuvey? Uh, where is Tuvey on this list? Jeff Tuvey, 58.1. That's pretty... See, that's the next level up. Yeah. What uh, What about... Um, I mean, the, the coach and ranks it. Hey, hey I, I just saw one. What? 59.3%. Phil Gould. <laughs> yeah. Well, Phil Gould's the greatest coach. To say. Phil Gould is the perfect guy to coach any team. Just ask Phil Gould. That's right. Um, Oh yeah, Jim Demick, sixty-two point five percent. Who? When did he? Did he get an interim go? Yeah, the Bulldogs. Bulldogs in twenty eleven. I can't remember that. Hey. Yeah, well, who's was it? Kevin Moore. Was he the coach of the Bulldogs and he got the R? Yeah, it was. So Kevin Moore was the coach, mm. and he got the sack. Mm-hmm. And the Bulldogs were fourth on the ladder. Only I can only remember Penrith doing that when they got rid of Griffin. We were fourth on the ladder when we got rid of Griffin. That can't be right. But, yeah, that's I funny. can't imagine the Bulldogs did that. No. No, that that's... Oh, maybe. I, I don't know. Bulldogs finished in, in ninth place on the ladder that year. Yeah. Equal on points with the Knights who are eighth, uh-huh. but behind them on points difference by 75 points. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I can't remember Jim Dimmick. I, look, I, if they got Jim Dimmick as coach, I'd be like, cool, let's see how he goes. Like, I wouldn't I wouldn't be upset to see him as the coach. Um, but I, I, as I said, I think they'll go for a name. Look, they had that – remember, they had that fucking ridiculous review that they got um, Nathan Brown who, to do. <laughs> and, so who did that review? It was Nathan Brown, and well, he come out West of it. Tigers, and, I was going to say, the West Tigers got someone to do a review of their club once, and that person's name was Brian Smith. Well, they, they also got Tim Sheens to come in and do a review of the club, and Tim Sheens said, you uh, know who you need to have as a coach? It's fucking me, fellas. Um, but Nathan Brown did that review of the club, and his review come out, one of the things that come out about it was nepotism. <laughs> and out of that, a lot of pressure was put on Brad Arthur to – dump his, his son out of the side, uh, Jake Arthur. Green so the, the club did that, and then they were left without a backup halfback. Yeah. Which was stupid. Um, so, yeah. It, good work, Nate. Yeah, good stuff. Nathan Brown. If you, if you want your team to go terribly, get Nathan Brown. He's got the record to prove it. He does. All right, let's have a look at some Parramatta players. Who could potentially become the coach there? Who have never done coaching before? Okay, because like, I mean ever? that's what some some of these clubs do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got Nathan Highmarsh who's played the most games for the club. I don't even think Parramatta are that stupid. Okay, there is someone on this list who's high on the list who has done a little bit of interim coaching. Okay, Luke Burt. He's twice he's been the interim coach at the Tides when they've sacked coaches that were sitting there. Really? Yes. Um, look, I once again, it kind of like Jim Dimmick. Why not? Um, Nathan Kalis. Uh, why, again, why not? If it, as long as they've got a coaching background and they've been doing it for years. Um, yes, we've got here Jared Hayne. <laughs> I dare say that it won't be Jared. In fact, you know what? I'll guarantee right now it won't be Jared Hayne. <laughs> Tell you what, he'll do a better job than Trent Barrett. I would say Jared Hayne 
as the coach ahead of Trent Barrett. Definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, my God. Oh, we'll have to move on. That's going down a bad avenue. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's um, that's rough. I was just having a look at Trent Barrett's record as well. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, boy. Trent Barrett has won 10 of his last 54 NRL games as head coach. Holy fucking hell. That is um, really bad. Yeah. That's really bad. That's like, that's like, that's really bad. <laughs> well, yeah. it, you and me joked about it on the podcast when the, the rumors were circulating that like, oh, Trent Barrett's the next, the next coach. And it's like, you can't just say it. You can't just say like, I'm the next new NRL coach. Like you've got to kind of have coached for many years and learn the craft and then like show that you can apply it. And he never really ever did that. And then when he got his chance to apply that, he showed that he was not anywhere near a coach. And here he is, coaching an NRL team. Pretty fucking amazing. In his almost season and a half at the Bulldogs, he had five wins. Holy crap. <laughs> he didn't even have the worst Bulldogs team. Dean Pay had a way worse team than he had. Mm. Like, Dean Pay had a New South Wales Cup side. And that's being generous to them. Yeah. If they got Dean Pay, he's a former Parramatta player. Dean Pay, give him a go. Absolutely. That's a, yeah, my God. That's mediocre. That really is. That's, uh, <laughs> I know you and me are the same sort of, like if, if we weren't recording, we'd just like to sit and like stare at a wall for five minutes just to contemplate all of that. That's shocking. Um, can we talk about, I don't think we got a chance to address the whole David Fafida, um, situation. Oh, yeah, the, um, the backflip. Now it's interesting, right? Cause you and me, I think we handled this really well. And I think if you listen to the last, I think probably the last podcast we did, cause we missed a week cause I was under the weather. Um, I think we summed it up pretty well that he would have to walk away from a lot of money at the Gold Coast. If he went to the Panthers, he had a chance to walk into a very, very interesting situation. And then there was the Roosters thing that sort of come up pretty late. And I think we set it out that I, from memory, it was like we felt like the Panthers were the least likely option. And then he seemed like he was going to be a Rooster, but, you know, it's a lot of money to walk away from. He made the decision that he was going to go to the Roosters. And within a couple of days, he woke up and said to someone, I don't think I want to go. I think I want to stay, right? Now, my guess is that he he got wrapped up in the process. I, this is, I don't base this on anything other than just a feeling. I feel like he had his deal at the Titans. He went down, remember last year, had a look at the Raiders, saw what they had on offer. Nothing really come of that. Then I think it got closer to decision time. He saw that the Panthers had some money available and was like, I'll check this out. That probably intrigued him as I think it intrigued you and me if he had gone there. And then the Roosters come in with an offer and all of a sudden he's, he's like going to the Roosters and stuff. And I think maybe he got caught up in the process, signed a deal. And then he sort of thought to himself, man, I want a million bucks a year here for the next two years. If I stay, what am I doing? You know, that's my guess. I think that's pretty fair. I, I said uh, in the episode previous that uh, I thought he would sign for money, not for success, mm-hmm. basically. And that's kind of what's happened. Um, the thing I found most interesting about it all is the way the Roosters PR team tried to handle it. Mm-hmm. They've come yeah, out and said, they basically came out and said, Oh, because he's been indecisive, we just withdrew the offer. <laughs> By then, yeah. he'd already signed the fucking so, extension. <laughs> basically, you can't you can't leave because we sack you. Yeah. <laughs> and I went, yeah, I just don't buy that. I I don't know. I I, I just think that's uh, that was horseshit. Well, the I mean, the Titans announced that he had so- signed the contract extension, and then the Roosters come out and said they'd withdrawn the offer, and it's like. 
It's just, that just is bullshit. It's just complete bullshit. Yeah. And it's so basically they're, they're, making, they're, they're making it out like, um, oh, because we withdrew the offer, he had no other options but to sign with the Titans again. Because, yeah. you know, we are a desirable club mm. and no one would come here and sign a contract and then say, you know what, I don't want to play for the Roosters, the almighty, magnificent, glorious Roosters. Mm. No one would ever say that. Exactly. So, of course we withdrew the offer. It was, it was pretty, uh, it was it was sad for the Roosters, really, wasn't it? Well, I I thought it was rather funny. And then the the one thing that was interesting was because I caught a caused a little kerfuffle on Twitter because I said about how we've got, and I didn't even name anyone. I said we've got a team in the NRL that doesn't produce players that invest no money in junior development and uh, just leeches off everyone else. I didn't name a club. I was so actually you're, talking, you're clearly talking about the storm. Exactly. But Roosters fans got very fucking angry, right? Even though I hadn't named a club. And hang so on, hang, when, on, hang on, hang on. Um but not bread. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go on, continue. Continue. <laughs> Some of the mental gymnastics I saw people doing was amazing. There's one person that was like, that's not true. They actually add some funding to three local clubs. And it's like, really? Three whole clubs? Um, but, uh, but yeah, when David Fafita decided he was going to stay at the Gold Coast Titans, it was very beautiful to be able to tweet, well, now the Roosters will have to rely on their junior development system. <laughs> um, so that felt good. But, uh, yeah, I, I had no problems with what transpired as a Panthers fan. It would have been interesting to see Fafida plugged into the Panthers team. Um, but, you know, like, what, am I going to complain? Like, really? <laughs> have well, you seen us? <laughs> I, I think I, uh, I, I made a very, very, um, Powerful meme about you know who who the Panthers will now target, um, which I know you were a fan of. I just said, you know, Panthers will just go and sign John Bateman now. No, no, they want um, they want N- Nadine. Nadine is on board. She wants Bateman over um, Eisenhuth. She thinks Bateman is a much better player. So I mean, Penrith, you can't you can't ignore the Nadine. She is she is the Don. <laughs> you don't. You don't ignore the Don. She wants John Bateman. You've got to go get her. Go go get the Bateman. Get him in the side. Help, even make him captain. Just make sure Nadine is happy. And the Tigers will take Eisenhurst just to be just to be double sure. They would take Eisenhurst, I reckon, for Bateman. In a heartbeat. 100%. 100%. Yeah. Um, it, it's, look, it's interesting how we've got a few clubs in the NRL that have a lot of money to spend especially considering the play market is not great. I think we're going to find out who the smart clubs are and who are the clubs that are going after names. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. Oh, you know what? The, the whole timing thing really gets me as a Panthers fan because you think they've now got like, say they've got around one and a half million bucks to spend, right? Because of the sequence that it all happened, they were not able to retain players. I'm sure they would have been able to retain. So, like, if, if, if say Luai, say it had gone in a different sequence, I have no doubt Luai would stay at the Panthers, 100%. Like, even if they didn't offer him what the Tigers are going to offer him, if they offered him a little bit less, I think he would have stayed at the Panthers. Um, but it didn't work out that way. It's really interesting. On that. Yes. And I didn't get to raise this in the last episode because I just completely forgot. Yes. But there was some comments by Ivan Cleary. And it's the first time I've seen him have a whinge. Mm -hmm. And I found it laughable because he complained about, you know, we should get extra funding from the NRL for developing all of these players, which end up going at other clubs. Mm -hmm. And most of the times when you hear about clubs who have been successful for any short period of time, the yeah. Panthers have not been successful for a short period of time in modern times, but um, this line often comes out. And I vaguely recall it might have been Tim Sheen said it during 2011, 2010, 2011, somewhere around there, when mm-hmm. the Tigers made the final two years in a row and started shedding players. 
to mm-hmm. other teams and stuff like that. And he came out saying, oh, you know, we've got such a big nursery and all the players are going to other clubs because we can't afford to keep more women. We should get something back. And I know other clubs have said the same thing when they've had a little bit of success and lost players as well. <clears throat> Storm and, uh, in particular, funnily enough. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, when a coach feels like he is doing such a good job that everyone wants his own players, instead of bitching and moaning about it, step back and go, you know what? I'm doing a good job. And B, this is how the salary cap works. And if it didn't work like this, mm. nearly every single coach and club would not get the opportunity for their turn to come around. I'm not saying that that's how the salary cap works, but mm. if we were still in the system where, you know, like when the Dragons were around in the mm. 50s and 60s, if they were still in play now, and Melbourne were getting funded by News Corp the whole time and able to buy whoever the hell they wanted, as yeah. were the Broncos, yeah. then that's who's going to be playing in the grand final every year is those two teams and no one else gets a look in. Well, so I mean, at, a at the moment... That prevents that garbage from happening. Yeah, and that look at the moment, it would be... Prob- I mean, you can you imagine what Penrith's team would be like if they could have just kept everyone? Like, it would... Like, we'd, oh, be, sitting here, so, we'd be sitting here saying, like, three... Like, yeah. if they get less than six in the next three, like, extra seasons, it'd be unders, you know? Um, You'd be looking at the squad going, okay, we've got to wait till all of these guys retire and hope that they don't replace them with similarly good talent so that anyone yeah. else can have a chance to win after that. It'd be kind of yeah. like watching the Super League waiting for Wigan to fail. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Um, so, like, I, I, like and we've talked about this before, you and me, 100%. Behind the salary cap, one like a thousand percent behind on salary cap. It's there's just no argument against it. Yeah. Um, I think that like with the storm, obviously the storm wanted to hold on to players that they bought from other junior nurseries and developed as, as senior players. So that's their that's been their argument there. I think that with the Panthers and it being like proper actual real local juniors and i'm not even talking about like isaiah yo who's not a local junior um like like actual grew up in the area local juniors i think it's a i think it's definitely something that should be done but i don't know how you implement that without without developing a system that gets gained so i like so, so let's say that there's a team. Let's go away from Western Sydney. Let's say there's a team, unnamed team in Eastern Sydney, right? That doesn't actually want to spend money on junior rugby league. Unnamed team. Um, and you could see a system that encourages that team to move younger players into that area on mass to then get down the track, the discounts on what you would term local juniors. And we don't want to encourage that system. That's why I think maybe what we need to look at is a system whereby, and I talked about this recently on Twitter, someone like DCE, who is not a Manly Seagulls local junior, like he's from Queensland, but if, like with how many games he's played for the Seagulls, if he didn't count against their cap whatsoever, I have no problems with that. Like 300 games at a club? Like how many 300-game players? Like in the whole history of the game, there hasn't been that many of them, right? How many 300-game at one club players have we had that you look at the point of their career where they hit 300 and you would say, oh, yeah, it'd, be, it'd feel really weird to give them a 100% discount I bet there's none of them. Probably Cameron Smith, to be honest. Yeah, and that, that's that's because you consider he played another 130 games after. But here's the thing, even even so, should he've really been counted against their cap for the last 130 games of his career? Look, like, I'm 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 largely on board with this idea, and I think yeah. too that we need to get no, not just not to go against what you've said about, you know, local junior stuff like that. I think we shouldn't be too hasty to throw away talent who a club has actually nurtured and got to first grade and made a first grade quality player. 
Mm. So the Storm do have some justification in their comments about, you know, we brought these players along and we made them the first grade players that they are because you can't argue with that. They were they were not wanted by anybody else. Yeah. And they turned and them into these players. every club has dudes like that. Every yeah, single and, club has dudes like that. And that is full credit to the club's development team to, to recognise that talent when no one else sees it, mm-hmm. to nurture it and to get them into being a first grade player and then get them up to that rep level after that and make them the household names and the superstars that they are. That is all to do with their development, and that should be that should count for something, no matter where that player comes from. Mm. And so, I think that that aspect of the the way players are developed is often disregarded, especially by the media, far too quickly, and it should be given a lot more praise. Yeah. Um, because that is a huge, huge component of, of how every club runs. You don't just buy a player and go. You know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You just go there and do whatever you did before and everything works. Go, no. No. Because, I mean, classic example, you look at Nico Hines. He was a fullback at the Storm. They've brought him in and changed the way he plays to be their halfback at the Sharks. He's a different human being and a different player to what he was at the Storm. But the Sharks have nurtured that and, and created that, and they've built their team around him to work to make all of that work together. And that's the same thing that the Storm does. It's the same thing the Panthers have done. Some some clubs like Penrith have a, a golden period where they've just got so much unbelievable junior talent constantly rolling through that they can cushion the loss of their mm-hmm. elite players with new talent coming through because the systems they've got in place to nurture that talent and develop it is unbelievably good. So it, it keeps working okay. But, yeah, I can get where Cleary can get the shits with it and just say, you know what, we're putting all this time and money into making these players first grade players and they go elsewhere. But you go, that is just the nature of the beast. Yeah. I said the thing is though, like I think the the thing with Penrith in particular is that they like they literally spend millions of dollars on local junior football. And like they definitely one hundred percent get something out of it. Like they, look at their team. You know, any time the Panthers Rugby League Club in the last 40 years have just turned their attention to their junior system, they win a premiership. When they turn away from it, they go bad. When they turn back to it, they win a premiership. It's really it's really obvious. So they get something out of it. But I, I think that the combination of things at the moment where you've got this Panthers team that is very, very much local juniors. And then on top of that, they're so good. And then on top of that, like they, I mean, we've gone through all of the talent that has left the club over the last four years, five years or so. It's outrageous how many good players they've lost and not, like, not just good players, like top of the line players again and again and again. And I think all of those things coming together, I understand the frustration there out of the Penrith club. I, I just, and I don't, as I said, I don't know how you, you have a system that incentivizes junior rugby league investment, local junior rugby league investment. Well, that, I mean, it's hard to because at the same time, I mean, on the absolute flip side yeah. is the West Tigers who have that massive yeah. catchment and they're not focusing on enough. And you look at nearly every NRL club out there, especially in Sydney, and they'll have a former West Tigers junior in their club. Yeah. So the West Tigers shouldn't be getting any reward for that player turning up another club and being great at another club because – they didn't take that opportunity on board when they had them. Well, at so the you've, same got to time, try and, you've got to try and find that balance between the two. Yeah, at the same time, like, there's been points where Penrith just have had so many good quality juniors that dudes have left to go and play elsewhere um, before they've even made their first grade debut because they needed to go and play somewhere. Like, it's hard to give an incentive to Penrith for that dude. But that's why I tend to go back to, like, if you play 300 games, you shouldn't count on cap. For the one club. Only the one club, though. Um, and where, it, like, when it gets to 250, like, I don't know, 25%, and but maybe... They do have something similar to that at the moment, but it's not... It's, it's tiny, not very though. Yeah, it's tiny. Yeah, it's like, I remember it's, when they brought it in, it was... Um, Robbie Farrer was immediately caught up in a bit of a drama which put the Tigers over the cap because the Tigers mm-hmm. thought that they were going to get the... Loyalty um, credit for Farrah, but they said 
one of the junior teams he played for was in the Bulldogs area, not the West Tigers one, and he was there for one year, and that one year was the one that prevented them from getting the discount that year, and they went over the cap by $5,000 or something pissy. Yeah, and that's um, where you start to get into, like, game in the system in the in junior footy, you know? Because, yeah. like, you could even see something like, say, let's say Penrith. Let's use Penrith as an example. They wouldn't need to do this. But imagine if Penrith, um, there was incentives for local juniors, and then the West Tigers fall on tough times, and so Penrith says, look, we will take over the running of the MacArthur Region Junior Rugby League, or we will buy it off you for $5 million, right? Like, you could see gaming the system like that. I don't want to see that. I, I know you don't want to see that, right? Mm. Um, that's why I think that if you just you go on something simple, if you, if you made your debut for that club, you played 300 games, you played 250 games, maybe even take it down to 200 games where you get... 10% off your contract under the salary cap. Uh, I don't think anyone would have a problem if a 200 gamer at one club had 10% of their contract not counting on the cap. Especially with the cap so fucking high right now. It would certainly, um, certainly force clubs and players to be more loyal to one another. Because if you started getting that discount, Clubs will say, well, because we're getting, a, say, a 10% discount for you, we will offer you 10% more, knowing that, that extra 10% won't count anywhere. Yeah. So the player can earn more at the club if they stay there than if they were to go to another club. They become a bigger burden on the salary cap if they go to another club for the same wage. Yeah, and surely that's what we want to see. Well, that, like, that would make sense. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, I look at someone like a DCE and I'm like, that dude should play for Manly as long as he wants to and as long as Manly will have him. And I, if he's on a $3 million contract from now on, because he's only just gone over the threshold for it, if he's on a, a contract for them from now on, $3 million contract, cool. I don't care. Hmm. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm just having a look now to see how many players actually played 300 games just for one club. I bet there's, I'm going to say there's. This is, a, this, this is one of those things that we end up doing at the end of an episode. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to say, okay, here's, here's the go. I'm going to say. Do you, want, do you want to guess who they are? Yeah, I'm going to guess who they are. Ready? <laughs> yep. Um, DCE. Uh, yes. Darren Lockout. Yep. Um, oh, Cameron Smith. Yep. <sighs> I can't remember if he got there or not. I feel like he didn't. Billy Slater? Uh, no, he got there. 319. Okay, 300. Okay. Um, uh, ooh, now it's getting difficult for me. Uh, give me a hint. Give me, it's, throw me a freaking bone here. Um, Sharks players, two of them. Oh, uh, I almost called him something else. Gallon? Yep. Peachy? No. Not Peachy. I thought Peachy. No, he went, he went to South as well. Oh, that's right. I always forget about his stint at South. Damn it. <laughs> I still remember when he went to Weirdness. I remember that. Forget his stint at South. <laughs> Another Sharky. Oh, E.T. Yep. Uh, uh, so, who's got here? Another so, Bronco? That's me up to six already. Um, did Kevy Kevin Walters make three hundred? Uh, yeah, I believe he did. Where is he on this thing? No, oh, but he on, doesn't care because he played for Canberra. He played for Canberra. Yeah. Um, three hundred gamer for the I bet it, when you tell me, I'm going to be angry. Oh, what yeah. about? Uh, don't don't go too far back. He played in more recent times. Oh, really? Because I was going to say Alfie Langer. Um, recent times, three hundred gamer. Oh, uh, Corey Parker? Yeah. Yeah. Who's next on the list? South player? Oh, uh, John Sutton. Yep. Uh, 300 gamer. Parramatta player? A para player, 300 games. The only one. Recent? Uh, I think he retired in the early 2000s. Okay. Uh, ooh, man. Parramatta player. Second row. 
Origin test for you. Oh, a uh, fucking Hindmarsh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who else have we got over here? Um, two Raiders so that, players. Two Raiders players with the same surname, but they're not related. Oh, really? No, Drew, no Druku? Um, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so I think we're already up to seven, so it's more than I said six. Um, two Raiders players. Uh, well, Ricky Stewart doesn't count because he w- went to the Bulldogs. Yeah. But he went to the Bulldog. Did he go to the Bulldogs after he? Uh, I think he. I don't. I don't think. Yeah. He didn't. He didn't even get the three hundred games either. Because no, no. um, the end of his career was very injury riddled. Yes. Um. What about? D- does Mal Meninga count? Uh, no, he didn't get the three hundred either. Oh, I was going to say. Um, 300 games for the Raiders. They've both, and by the way, you told me they both have the same name. It's Crocker. So, I'm an idiot. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Crocker. Jay, Jason Croker and Jared Croker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, One of them plays is really good. Who a else? Bulldogs, a Bulldogs winger. Oh, it has him. Yep. Uh, Roosters player. Uh, it's, what's his name? He played second row, centre, yeah. bench, lock, five eighth, and hooker. Orbison? That's the one. Um, I forget his name. Sydney born Broncos player? <laughs> A Sydney born Broncos player. Yep. It's not Chris Who's... Johns? No. Played for, played for Queensland as well. Ah. A Sydney yeah. born Broncos player that played for Queensland. And Australia. Um, ooh, this one's got me. Hey, <laughs> this one's really got me. Uh, uh, Sydney born. No, I don't know this one. Sam Sido. I thought he was born in Melbourne. No. Oh, okay. I thought he was born in Melbourne some, for some reason. And we've got two more Roosters players and a Warriors player. Warriors player would be Simon Mannering. Correct. And the two Roosters players played up until the early 2000s. Early 2000s. Minicello? Yep. And? That one was a lock. Oh, Rickardson. Yes. I think I did pretty well then, Andrew. You have done indeed. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. Josh Papali is currently on 292 games for the Raiders. See, he's another one. Once he gets to 300, if he come (laughs) off their salary cap completely, I'd have zero problems with it. Now, the one question I do have is uh, Steve Menzies. Mm-hmm. Does he classify as playing for Beaver? Was he, was, does he classify as playing for two teams or one in, in, your, uh, in your estimations? Because he played 280 games for Manly and 69 for the Northern Eagles. Nice. Um, nice. That's, the, that's a weird one, hey? I, the thing that gets me is Manly doesn't want it to be. So if Manly doesn't want it to be, how can I want it to be? <coughs> That's fair. Because I was going to say, if they said yes to that, then yeah. they could say yes to Cliff Lyons, who played 23 games for the Bears before going to, to Manly for 300 games. <laughs> That's bloody <laughs> cheeky, that is. That's very <laughs> cheeky. And I'm here for it. There we go. I was thinking about Cliff Lyons the other day. What a what a amazing player he was. Like, it's hard to explain how good he was. Like, if he was playing now... He'd be the best five eighth in the game, and we wouldn't even it just just be like, it, not even a question. Like the Cameron Smith as as a, as a hooker when he was playing, and it was like, yeah, it's Cameron Smith, best hooker in the game. Don't even talk about it. He'd be the best five eighth in the game. We wouldn't even talk about it. But because of the era he played in, like he, there was so many great five eighths, like all time all timers around him, and that's the only oh, yeah. thing that stopped him from playing like. Probably record number of tests and origins, really. And the Bears didn't quite know what to do with him. Mm. And that was the reason why he kind of ended up at Manly. Because in his time at, at North Sydney in 1985, it was his only season there, he was bench, 5'8", centre, lock. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They just moved him around everywhere. They just... Like, he played most of his games at 5'8", there, but they could never fully understand where to make him fit into the side. They just moved him around everywhere. Mm. And then he went over and played um, <clears throat> played for Leeds throughout 1985-86, and they just went, yeah, you're a 5'8". Yeah. 
and they left him there. He dabbled at, at you know in the halves and you know half back and occasionally in centre occasionally. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he went to Manly for 1986, and for that first season at Manly, they just had him at lock because they had Hasler and Tuvi in the halves. Mm-hmm. So they just had him at lock the whole way through. And then in 1987, he moved into the 5 role. Never went back. Yeah. Never went back. Until he retired. <laughs> Basically, yeah. It's, it's just uh, crazy to see how someone who just you always think of was just an out-and-out 5 eight, hmm. And just no one knew what to do with him initially. And so you look at the start of his career and you go, it looks very, very similar to what Tyro Peachy struggled with. Yeah, I was thinking about Tyro Peachy. Hey. You go, it's just, where does he fit? You don't quite know. You know he's a he, ball player. Yeah, he's a footballer. Yeah, and he's a he's, good line runner. He, he's always he, running at the line first instincts. So you're going. He's got this skill set. How do you yeah. use it? Yeah. And back then we had, like in the 80s, we had the lock forward went from being um, basically a third second roller who played in the middle. That's what they were at the time, um, to being a ball playing forward. Yeah. And so people like, like Des Hasler, good uh, was a good example. Um, Terry Lamb, Jeff Tuvey, oh, sorry, not Jeff Tuvey, um, um, Cliffy Lyons. People like that would occasionally be put into the lock position. If they saw it's an opportunity to try and, you know, break up, uh, opposition's defence or something like that, or, you know, might add a bit of extra strike to the forward pack, things like that. And so they were a bit of a, had quite a utility value about them. But yeah, it was always interesting. I was, I'm always fascinated by how the start of his career, no one was really too certain what to do with him until, you know, until he, he had a bit of a stint at Leeds. And they went, yeah, we think you're a 5 eighth mate. We'll just put you there. Also think about the fact that when he came from the bush, he was signed by originally the Cronulla Sharks. That's right, yeah, and he played low and grades they, for them. Yeah, imagine if the Sharks had have just brought him in as a five eighth, because um, they were like in the nineties they had some really good sides. Even in the eighties they had some all right teams, but it really solidified in the nineties. Um, imagine how things would have been different if he was a five eight, because he was like he would have been exactly what they needed. Like a a big game player, first of all, but a guy that added something a little bit different, a little bit of creative flair and stuff like that. Desperately what they needed. And uh they had it they had it right there and they let it go. Yeah. Think what could have been. Mm. Um it's an, a, that's one of those classic ones, like what the hell could we have had? Because they didn't really have a set five eighth at that time. They were sort of hopping around a bit themselves. Mm. Um mm. So, yeah, that could have done with a, a legit halves combination. But yeah, that's a, a fascinating one, that one. Yeah. We've started, to talk, is, about, was, we've started well, to talk about rugby league history. Hey, what are we, we doing? We have, we have. That, that's <laughs> Just so everyone knows, I am still working on the follow-up to the uh, the episode at the start of the year. I'm, I'm close to halfway through it. It is quite a lengthy beast, this next one. Could be longer than the first episode. Yeah, I can't wait to do that, hey. And it's just 1908. Um, but just as a, a, a small snippet, I found one article that was talking about the Queenslanders' first game of rugby league they've ever played mm-hmm. against the New Zealand team in 1908. Mm-hmm. And one of the journos wrote about the um, one of the Queensland players and just said, quite simply, he has no heart. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, we're not fucking around here, are we? <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty cutting, that. That's savage. So, uh, but yeah, there's 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 plenty of good uh, history content coming up very soon. I know I want to have that done before May. Yep. And uh, it's going to take a little bit longer, but I'm I'm yep. working on it a lot more. So I'm trying to get through it as quickly as possible so we get it that done and out soonish. As they say in the classics, it takes as long as it takes. This is true. This is true. Mm. But yeah, that's, that is definitely happening. Um, what else is definitely happening? Any other uh, news? What else? Have we, oh, you know what? I, 
Remember in the last episode, I started talking a little bit about the next broadcasting deal. Um, and it's oh, interesting. Yeah. I just, I don't know. I just got a feeling about it when I started talking about it and went into a little bit of depth of what I expect to happen. And That's right. you're was, talking about, yeah, you know, what if Netflix was to get rugby league or something like that? Well, more like I, the one I think will go after it's Amazon. And I base mm-hmm. that just on a hunch. I've just seen what Amazon is doing overseas. I'm seeing the way that they're, they're pivoting their, their, uh, streaming service and all of the infrastructure they've had on the flow and effects to the rest of their business that can justify huge, huge, huge broadcasting rights deals. And it was interesting because a few days later, the, there was little whispers here and there about the NRL broadcasting deal and how it would fund the expansion of the NRL. And, and we're going to get, they're talking about getting at least two new clubs off the next deal and maybe three. They really yeah, want to push. talk about getting to, to 20 teams. Yeah. Which I think is a good goal to have. I think we can, we, it's fair. It's fair goal, especially if one of them is New Zealand and one of them is, uh, PNG, like those player bases are, are kind of there right now. It's well, just if a we, if, if we go New Zealand, PNG, WA, mm-hmm. bam, no brainer for me. Yeah, same here, same here. I, I, that's just simple, real, like really straightforward. Um, I saw, and I didn't read it, but I saw there was a bit of an article in the Sydney Morning Herald by an unnamed pirate talking about how we need to have Rugby League on free-to-air TV. Now, Sydney Morning Herald is owned by Channel 9, which is a free-to-air TV station, funnily enough. This so, masthead. This masthead. i got to start using that more on my my uh, uh-huh. website. But <laughs> it, it, when I saw that, I was like, okay, they're beginning now. They're starting to talk about it themselves because we, I think we're going to see, like we always do, a lot of propaganda coming out from the broadcasters themselves talking about how important it is that the NRL doesn't leave them and that we have rugby league on free-to-air TV and all that sort of stuff. Now, in 2024, I think it's fair to say that free-to-air TV and its importance to rugby league isn't as vital as it was, say, in 2019. Do you think that's fair to say? Absolutely, absolutely. If we and, saw, sorry, go on. And I think a lot of the um, Sydney Morning Herald masthead talk is going to be about comparing rugby league to rugby union. Go, oh, look what happened when rugby union went all to pay TV. Where mm-hmm. is it now? And you go, exactly. yes, but, but. When Rugby Union went all the way over to pay TV, that was when subscription TV was still in its pretty much early days. Yes. And so no one was really thinking, why should I have to pay for TV? Mm-hmm. Whereas now, now everyone's going, why would I watch free-to-air TV? I also think it ignores the fundamental, the fundamental problems that Rugby Union has right now. Because I think if you went back to say 2003, where Rugby Union was pretty high on itself in Australia, they would have said that being on pay TV only has been a boom for us. You know, it's just the fact that that there's a lot of problems with Australian Rugby Union that have been a long, slow process to get to where they are now that you can sort of point to, well, it's obviously pay TV. Being on pay TV is a problem, you know. But the, no, no. But I mean, that's the angle that the media will use yeah. in order to justify keeping rugby league on free to wear. Because that's because that's the only the only argument they have in their favour that people might be able to believe. I have a friend that lives in South Australia, right? And she's thirty. We we played the Xbox together. For Has many, she murdered for... anyone? Uh, no, we, I, I give us so much shit about living in, in Adelaide. I give that, constant shit about it. Does she it. drink the tap water? I don't believe she does. She's smarter than that, see? Um, she, can't be, she can't be from South Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so she lives in South Australia. And I remember about five years ago talking to her about um, 
It might have been like the state of origin because, like, when when the footy's on, I, I don't play the Xbox with her, right? And we're just mates, by the way. I'm not talking about anyone fucking like that. But um, so when State of Origin be on, I'd be like, oh, State of Origin's on tonight, and it's Wednesday, you know, normally when I'd play Xbox. And she'd be like, oh, man. And, and I'd, I've said to her, I think she'd really enjoy rugby league. And she's like, uh, you know, whatever. And I said to her, you can actually watch this game. It's on, it's on free-to-air TV. You should chuck it on for 10 minutes. And she was like, I don't even have my ray, my aerial connected to my TV. <laughs> and I, it was a real moment of like, ah, okay, that's interesting, right? Yeah. And uh, like you think of where younger people, and not even super younger people, you think of what where they're consuming their media and how they're consuming their media. It's all stream. Like it's yeah, just everything. Everything is online. Everything, absolutely everything. Even the free to air TV stations are online. Like you can stream yep. their, their shit online. So I don't know that in 2024 it is the be all and end all to be on free to air TV. It definitely helps in some ways. It's a, a ease of ease of use, but. Eventually, that ease of use is not going to actually be there for a larger and larger section of our community and the wider community because it will be much easier for them to stream something. And I think we need to keep that in mind with the next TV deal. I think when's that kick in? Like maybe 2026, something like that? Yeah, I'm pretty sure the, the last one was, I think they've only been doing two or three years. Deals. They're yeah. not long ones anymore. And I, which but I think, they shouldn't be. But I think the next one is going to be a longer deal, right? Because when if, you... Well, cost- look, if, if it, I was going to say, if it's going to be with a streaming service, then that might be the only way to get that deal across the line is to make it a long-term one. Yeah, and it's going to be like... It, when you decide to cross the threshold, you might as well do it full on, you know? Mm-hmm. And it's... It, but it it really will depend on if Amazon comes into it and if Netflix comes into it. Netflix recently uh, live streamed the Tom Brady roast, which was a huge thing. And so they're starting to look at live streaming events themselves. And if those, if either of those come into the the market, and the reason I say Amazon is because they can have the flow on effect to the rest of their business, it makes a lot of sense for them. And I, I wouldn't be shocked. And the thing is, I've, I saw some people arguing that like Peter Volandis won't turn his back on Channel 9 and, and this sort of stuff. And I understand that argument. I really do. It makes a lot of sense. But I think that if the money was there and it was big enough, the clubs would force the issue. And I think even the Players Association would put their two cents in and say, Hey, you can't leave. Like you can't leave four hundred million dollars on the table to establish your relationship with Channel Nine. You know what I mean? I, yeah. Look, I I don't know that Vlandy's is that strongly linked to Channel Nine, and I say that through not so much through his rugby league association, but more through the horse racing stuff because that is very strong on Sky, which mm-hmm. is all on Foxtel. So mm-hmm. I think his association with Foxtel is probably stronger. So I dare say. The next TV rights deal, if done correctly, would be a combination of Foxtel and streaming stuff, say like Amazon. It would be that sort of a thing. So that you don't lose any of your current viewers who are what, who are nearly all of your current NRL viewers are watching the game on Fox Sports or KO. Yeah. Right. If, if, if there's any rugby league fans and the only consumption of rugby league is free to air TV, they are very minute in numbers by now, I'd imagine. And, so, and I think, like, there's look, we've got anti-siphoning lists where you've got to have certain events on free-to-air TV, and rugby league's one of them. But as I've said, laws are there to be changed. Um, and so, no, look, like, it's simple. Just say, you know what? The what we will allow to have on free-to-air TV is the complete broadcast of all of the um, reserve grade Cup, New South Wales and Queensland Cup. <clears throat> Well, I, th- I think it... Or yours, Channel 9. Yeah, I think it would be more along the lines of, 
if they look to completely <coughs> get off of free to air TV, like I, here's what I could see happening. I could see, and I'm going to use Amazon as the example because to me it makes so much sense, right? If they went full stream and to someone like Amazon, I could then see them holding back, say, the uh, State of Origin series and the maybe the final series and grand final for free to air TV, right? That, that to me would make a lot of sense. You might even sprinkle in games during the year. Maybe it's one game around. You know, because they're going to have extra games because they want to get to 20 teams, right? So they're going to have extra games. Give them to Channel 9 so, and you've got the rest on your streaming service. <clears throat> if they leave Fox Sports slash Foxtel, it's devastating to that company. It's like, because they've got AFL and NRL and then they've got other sports there. If Rugby League walks away from a deal with them, it's not just like at losing 50%. It's like losing like about 60, 65% because advertisers are now only getting their products and their, their things shown basically in the southern states of Australia because, and they'll lose billions of dollars. They'll literally lose billions of dollars. So the NRL is in a really strong position right now. And this next TV deal should be ridiculous ridiculously high and I expect it to be a longer term deal it, it, and it's either going to be someone like an Amazon coming in and saying go full on we will give you more money than anyone else can and believe me they could outspend any fucking other company out there they're like one of the biggest companies in the world and they won't even feel it so if they want it they will get it at the same time that threat will push up the price of everyone else the only loser I really see in any of it would be Channel 9, who I don't know if they've got the money to compete with any of it. Like Foxtel and Fox Sports, they have to do it because it's their entire business basically on the line. Yes. Channel 9, I don't know that they've got the cash to go with it. And so I think we'll see way less games on Channel 9 next time around or free to air TV in general. And yeah, I think we're we're going to see a big change coming up, and I think it'll be okay for the game. I think we'll be fine. I've had an idea. Hit me with that. Well, we know how the Labor government is keen to tip way too much money into having a PNG team come into the NRL. Yes. What if Peter Vlandy said, we will take... Half of what you're offering will bring in a PNG team, but the rest of the money that you're offering can go towards having the NRL being played on the ABC. That would be just one game a week. And just like the deal they've got with the with Channel 9, but mm-hmm. it would just be on ABC instead. And that way it's government funded. Plus they're getting the, the big coin for a PNG team. And that's what they do. And they can play it any way they want because they know that the government wants a team in PNG. <clears throat> so you just go, well, if this is what you want, then you're going to have to give us what we want. Part, part putting, it, putting, it, putting the game on ABC, yeah. it doesn't matter how it's, you know, how it's broadcast, whatever goes on there. Yeah. That means Channel 9 now has another competitor. You either improve your product or you stop. Without and, you have to, to, and you have to put up your bid as well. Without wanting to get political, I well, feel like I mean, government... I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not bringing politi- politics no, no. really into it. This is just we we know that there's been a, a suggestion put forward by the Labor government, and they want to have a team in PNG for not entirely rugby league purposes. Okay, no. we don't need to go into what the purposes are, but they're willing to chuck more money than is necessary to put a team there, and so it's something that. Peter Volandis could use as leverage to say, okay, well, if this is what you want, then this is what we want, okay? And if you want I what like, you want, then you need to give us what we want. I like your thinking, right? But part of me feels like this current government, with the way they spend money, will be like, man, we'll give you that for free anyway, and we'll chuck in a 747 if you fucking want. <laughs> take it, take it. That's, but this is, this is my point, is that's what you should be doing, Okay. Yeah. When you when you've got someone who really wants to give you a fuck ton of money because they've got other reasons for it, 
Mm. And you go, well, while we're here, mm. we also want this. And I think they'll, I think that they play, they started playing, the NRL started playing hardball last weekend with this PNG bid and the funding that the Australian government wants to put in. And it, it seems like the Australian government was like, whoa, 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 we'll give you the money. Don't worry. So it, it's, and I found that really interesting because it is so, like it is, it is the godfather offer for a team. Like if, if someone in Perth said, we'll give you this amount of money for a team in Perth, we'd probably have a Perth team next year. Like it's so that next, much money. Next week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> can we, Fucking can we sharks would be on down? the plane. <laughs> we'll, we'll just uh, extend the competition by a few extra weeks. We'll get it in. Don't worry about it. We'll be fine. <laughs> Actually, that makes me think, right? And this is typical government too, right? <laughs> For a tenth of the money that they want to spend on a PNG team, they could literally buy an NRL club and move it up there. <laughs> <laughs> Like, what the fuck are they doing? <laughs> like, like, they, they want to spend, what is it? Isn't it $600 million? Like, it's oh, something, it's something fucking outrageous. Oh, it's, it's 300 million, maybe something. It's, it's an insane volume of money. Yeah. But like, I reckon you could get an NRL club for, I reckon you could probably get one for 20. I reckon you could get one for 20, definitely. Like, so for the amount of money that they want to throw around, they could just buy Super League. <laughs> They, well, yeah. You know, that's, buy, that's buy Super crazy. League. Think of it a different way. Hey, like, how buy much Super League cost? and then, okay. and then relocate League to Papua New Guinea. <laughs> how much would it cost <laughs> to buy the Manly Seagulls with an offer that the owner could not turn down? About 15 bucks, I think. <laughs> so, say you went to him and said, we'll give you 30 million for the Seagulls. He'd have to take that, right? They'd take it in a heartbeat. Six hundred million dollars. Yeah, it's They're a typical it government move. Well, the, you play you, you play hardball against no one. <laughs> it's it's crazy when you think of it that way. My goodness. But yeah, oh, that, that, that's that's how nuts it is. They they could actually buy the second biggest professional league in the competition and have change. Oh, one hundred percent. With the money they want to throw around. I feel like you could probably buy I really and I'm not disparaging NRL teams, like I'm 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 saying like like if you go say you went to the Manly, three hundred uh thirty million, sorry. If you went to Cross Russell Crowe and offered him thirty million, he'd probably need to think about it really, really carefully. Um, who else could you offer it to? Like the sharks have always been available to buy. They have been bought in the past. They're they're a little bit better off now. Um, yeah. This is the federal government and the NRL close, closing in on a deal worth up to six hundred million dollars to secure an NRL side based in PNG. Say so you took a tenth of that, Andrew. So here we go. I'm looking here. What are NRL clubs worth? This is just a quick look on on uh, on Google. Oh, okay. The Penrith Panthers Leagues Club is worth six point two million. Okay. Yeah. Um. Parramatta Eels Leagues Club, fifteen point seven million. But is that the Leagues Club or the the whole that's, shebang? I think that's pretty much the whole shebang. But it's okay. Basically, if you've got twenty million dollars, you'll be able to buy nearly any NRL club. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like I think the only like the Broncos the would only, be the ones that are way over. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say the Broncos. The Storm might be another one because they're I'd, they're owned by wealthy people. Kind um, of. I mean, they they do have an operating loss, I believe, nearly every year. So that makes them less less of a, uh, I suppose, buy for anyone. I <clears throat> see. The thing is, I think that because it's so valuable having a storm there in Melbourne, like I, I think that there's some of those things that come into it. You know, like like there, there's not the same pressures in terms of valuation of the storm as there is to say and I'm just picking a team like Canterbury like there's a bunch of teams in Sydney you know where well, yeah, of course yeah um but yeah like 20 million like the Newcastle Knights they'd probably have to sell themselves for 20 million um my most nearly every team will pretty you'd much. be able to buy nearly every team for 20 mil the only um, thing that I think would come into it is that 
each team gets 15 million bucks a year out of the NRL and they get 10 million to cover their biggest cost, which is the players, the first grade players. So that might play with the true, the real world valuations of these teams. But I, I don't know how you'd calculate that. There'd be, there's smarter people than me that could calculate how that would work. 600 million though. Oh, that's 600 probably, million. You could, that's, you could that's buy. an insane volume. That must be, that would go close to being more than what Channel 9 is paying in the TV rights deal for their entire contract. Yeah. Yeah. That's why the NRL, like, I, I what you and me understand, you and me have talked about this, like, New Zealand needs a team ASAP and it's, it works football wise, business wise, all of that stuff. Perth needs a team and it works for TV, which works for business, right? Mm-hmm. This PNG team, there's a football element to it, definitely. But for the amount of money on offer, if they said we want to give you $600 million and put a team in Alice Springs, you just have to. If Mate, they, said, they, we're they give, said we're going to give you $600 million to put a team in Humula, we say yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a really good way to put it. So um, you, you can't say no to it. That's what I'm thinking is <clears throat> the NRL should try and get games back on the ABC if only – to put competition against Channel 9 to make them try and up their offer. Mm-hmm. And also so you can go to Channel 9 and say, we have a free-to-wear option. Mm-hmm. It's with the government. It's with the government's channel, the ABC. Mm-hmm. If you also want to get games on Channel 9, here's what we want from you, okay? If you're not willing to pay us more, then we want to see you improve the product that you're, you know, improve our product when you're pr- putting on the TV. We're not yeah. happy with how it's broadcast. We're not happy with this. We're not happy with that. We need to see active change in all of these starting now. And they're completely in the in the in the driver's seat when it comes to this negotiation. And that's what they should be doing. They can use the government's desire to give a fuckload of money for one team to get the game onto ABC, so they can use ABC Radio as well. Yeah. And try and get the coverage of the game across all media, TV and radio to be improved, to try and get rid of this negative, sneering, narky, aggressive, hateful attitude that goes on within the media. And all of the all of the commentators that are currently in the mainstream media who have got this really hateful, negative, rumour-mongering attitude towards the game mm-hmm. and have this holier-than-thou attitude, um, <coughs> poor Kent, um, <laughs> Over oh, cop is playing up tonight real bad. Um, it's a rough one. It's a rough one. But try and get those people put in check. And the best way to do that is to make them all realize that, hey, you know what? We have an alternative to what you guys are doing, and it's better, and people are going to like it because it's going to be free of all your bullshit. Mm-hmm. And it would be easy to put the games on ABC Radio, ABC TV, and have a broadcast in a positive manner. It would be an absolute piece of piss. And it would cost them next to nothing to do it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, man, it, it really, all of it together puts the NRL in such a strong position. And oh, absolutely. We're, we're going to see, man, the current, the current corporate media that currently has the rights, they are going to go nuts. They're going to say some shit, which is outright lies. They're going to say, they're going to chuck, oh, do you, do you really want to have another subscription to watch your footy? And it's like, well, uh, what, you mean switch from yours to someone else? <laughs> like, it's going to, it's kind of going to come down to things like that, but they're going to convince a lot of people that it, it would be the wrong move if the NRL chose to do something different. And the fact is that it probably won't be. And for the amount of money that might be on offer, it, it will just not even be a decision in a lot of sections of the game. And people need to be aware of that because... I, think, I reckon what we're also going to see mm-hmm. is all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we're going to get people like Matthew Johns giving us insights into how politics works and they're mm-hmm. going to be right-wing loony nutbags just to shit on Anthony Albanese to try mm-hmm. and make sure that this deal with the government doesn't go ahead mm-hmm. so that they can keep their cushy gigs in the media that they have. Because they will, they will all be under threat now. See, the good thing about, about, I'll speak for me. I won't speak for you. I don't like any of them from any of the teams, the political teams. 
So they can all get stuffed. I think of as low as all of them the same. So I don't have any bias towards any of them. <laughs> no, look, I'm not. I'm not biased one, one way or the other yeah. with, with political parties. Yeah. Um, and I've got I've got less interest in what goes on politically now because I, I don't know. I think I think just because you know I'm now how old did you say I was 49. Um, oh, yes. I've, got a, I've, I've got a birthday coming up soon too, so I'm going to be about 55 by the by that time that comes around. Um, you know I'm now a bit old. You wish hey you everything. wish you were still in your 50s by then, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> I've got about 20 birthdays though between now and then. <laughs> Oh, man. This time next year, I'm going to be the first 100-year-old po- uh, podcaster <laughs> in the world. <laughs> shit. I got so many people with that last year. I know. Oh, shit. That was so... Oh, it was the year before last, because last year, I, m- I missed it. I missed it. You kept it quiet. It was the year before last. But, yeah, yeah. it's it's funny. It's it funny. is. It is. But, oh. Leo, big, I think that it's it's a really exciting time for the game, and, and the next TV deal is going to be ginormous and it's going to be really exciting to see where it ends up and don't worry about what the media says wherever it ends up you'll be able to watch your footy oh so yeah don't don't worry don't worry about what they're saying because they're going to scare manga don't yeah. listen to them they've yeah. got a huge vested interest yeah and if, and if matthew john starts talking to you about politics just remember who he's put forward as coaching options in the past and, and owners if, of the Newcastle Knights. Yes, and if he can't get rugby league stuff right, then you know that politically he's completely out of his depth. So you just ignore <laughs> everything he says on that front as well. Yeah, exactly. But without even any consideration, you go, oh, Matthew Jones is talking politics. Click. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, by the way, can I talk about these? Like, there's people who Which watch people? NR, who watch NRL 360, right? Is there people still watching it? There is, because I see the ratings that. have been plummeting. Well. I, it's weird, on Twitter, you go on Twitter and people are posting, oh, I can't believe they're saying this, I can't believe they're, oh, they're terrible. And it's like, why are you still watching it? Stop I watching it. What, what's happened is they've got to that point that we were in after, about four years ago yeah. where they're rage-watching it now. Yeah, yeah. But the next point after rage-watching is what we also did, and that is not watching it at all. Yeah. Yeah, so they're getting close to not having a show anymore. Like, can you imagine turning on the TV and seeing Dean Ritchie talk about anything? Like, I'd just switch it straight off. He could be talking about, like, listen, I have the only ticket on the rocket ship that leaves for Mars because Earth is about to be destroyed, and I'd click it. I'd be like, I don't need to hear this fucking idiot. <laughs> um, yeah, Dean Ritchie is him and Crawley mm-hmm. um, and Rothfield. I just... All of them. I can't listen to them. I don't care about their opinions or their views. They are irrelevant in the rugby league world. As much as I try and tell you that they aren't, they really are. They're they're just irrelevant. Mm-hmm. Um, they're nobodies. And oh god, I tell you what though, the one person, it's, it's, and it's crazy. It's not even James Hooper because he's just he's just dumb. Um. The one person who irritates me the most that's in the rugby league media is Gordon Tallis. I know I I can't really put my finger on it why, but I see him on TV and I just go, I don't need to hear whatever he has to say. I don't care what it is. <laughs> he could be on there saying the most glorious things about me. I don't care. Mm. Don't want to hear see, it. Did you see him trying to explain how David Fafita's deal would work no, at no. the? He 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 said something funny. I, leg- I legit see, start seeing his face, and before yeah. anything comes out of it, out of any of the holes on his head, I turn it off. I'm not interested. I, based- I've got to the point now where I don't even watch any rugby league content that doesn't have a Von Sampson on it. <laughs> well, he, he said, I, I think it might have been NRL 360, and he said, like, so it was like a million dollars at the Gold Coast. For, and I'm just going to simplify it. So he said, like, it's a million bucks for three years at the Gold Coast, or it was, like, say, 900000 for three years at the Roosters. And he was like, so you've got to explain to people under the salary cap how that works, because in my head, it's like, at the Gold Coast, he gets a million bucks. It's like, it's like a pee rattling around in a can. <laughs> but he was like, at the, in my head, 
It's like he's on a million dollars every year. He's on a million dollars this year. He's on a million dollars next year. He's on a million dollars the year after. But at the Roosters, he's basically on a million dollars the first year, a million dollars the second year, and $300,000 the last year. How does that even work? And they're like, Gordon, it's, it, you average it over the years though, mate. Cause it's like, that's, he's like, nah, cause you look at the salary and it's million for, and he just said it again. And it's like, he had no fucking idea. Simple, simple math. He just didn't get it. It was so funny. Uh, uh, he's had contracts before. He might as well have been like, and they get 300 tests in the last year. What's up with that? <laughs> like it was at that level. It makes me wonder how the hell he got paid playing his football in his, uh, all his careers. Did Wayne better just throw a peanut at him every week? Man, Gordon, it, it, Gordon, here comes your pay. Open up, buddy. Ping. It really does make you think, hey? Like, <clears throat> like of, I don't care how dumb a player is. The one thing I expect them to fully understand is how the salary cap and their payments work because mm. they've been in that structure a lot. Mm, all yeah. of them. Yeah. All of them. So it just, I guess it proves my point that he's just, he's, he just shouldn't be listened to because he, he's got nothing to offer. I'll take yeah. Steve Roach over him. Steve Roach never, never played the entirety of his career in the salary cap era. Even the, the time that he did play, it was, a, it was a partial salary cap. Yeah. So I could understand it if Blocker didn't understand fully how it worked, mm-hmm. but he would because he's been an assistant coach during the salary cap era. So he'd, he'd understand. Enough about it, how it works. Yeah. Talos has got no excuse. I, right. I really, just on Steve Roach, I really, I know that you feel a little differently about Steve Roach's, um, commentary. I, I love listening to Steve Roach's commentary because no, it is at, what it at is. At times, at times, okay. There's, there's a few things that he says, right? The rhyming slang stuff, I still understand and I still get it because I'm, I'm 59 years old. <laughs> so I, I understand what he's saying. <laughs> My concern is, though, that by constantly using exactly the same rhyming slang, mm. all of the new listeners, who are far, far younger than I am, are going to go, what's, what's a Vera Lynn? Yeah. So it's, not, it's not what's a Vera Lynn. It's who was she? And she was a famous actress quite a long time ago, right? But it's things like that. And, you know, Rocky Boulder. Just say shoulder. It's less mm. words. He's doing it less though. He's definitely I, doing it. I less. know, and he has become much better to listen to because not only is he doing it less, he's also got back to doing the one thing that he is um, very, very underrated at, very, very good at, and that is actually having good analytic views on what's going on. You can hear him as it happened in a game recently. It might have been a Sharks game last week or the week before, mm. and the Sharks made a break and. He merely said, you got to go left. you got to go left. And they mm. didn't. Mm. And he was just screaming it out the whole time. And then when they come back, they pan back and they show the camera. And sure enough, you can see out on the left-hand side, massive gaps. And you go, oh, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I remember yeah, that. Yeah, Fuck is right. He saw yeah. that as they were break, making the break. Like he's saying, he's basically, in his head, he's saying, take the tackle, quick play the ball, go left, you'll score. And you, you know, sort of see that and reading it out in, in real time, and you can see all of that. I mean, that's why he was a very, very good player. He knew where the gaps were, and he knew where to be on the field. Any player in any position that's the elite level, their positional play is what makes them elite. Mm. So, of course, he knows that stuff. And I like it when he gets into doing that stuff. But he mm. had that period during during COVID where he was just doing – rhyming slang the whole time I was like I can't listen to you doing this I know what your potential is and how much good mm. how much better you can be at this and you're doing this dumb shit I can't hear it I don't want to hear it yeah yeah and that's I, what it is it got yeah it definitely got too much and like it's cool that he he toned that down because like yeah I, I I just really enjoy his commentary it's a and it just is what it is and not like I it's it's fun it's just a dude that's talking about footy and and i enjoy that i tell you who this might surprise you on the weekend watching the games um during magic round round i really enjoyed Corey parker's commentary he just i don't know what it was about it but he just he didn't seem as regimented in his commentary style did he he manage to say four words without getting confused how a sentence structure works yeah he just was like seemed 
he just seemed super relaxed and maybe he was just enjoying the whole thing and he just i don't know he like he was really talking a lot about about stuff you want to hear like i always think you've got to add to the coverage if you can and exp- and talk about things that a viewer either isn't isn't able to see because they're only seeing the camera angle or give them information that they're maybe not thinking about and stuff like that and he was he was just really really good this weekend like and i was listening to him over a few games and i was thinking man if he do commentary like this every weekend. Like he'd be one of my favorite commentary commentators. He was just fucking amazing this weekend. I hope that imp- uh, continues because yeah, for too long, whenever it seems like he's got stage fright or something, every time he's he's behind a microphone, it's like he he says three or four words and all of a sudden they all run into one another and he doesn't know what he's saying. He gets things mixed up and mumbled and he just gets confused and kind of like he's panicking a little bit. Yeah, and well, I've I've never thought of him as being stupid, mm. um, but he just didn't seem comfortable on air. And, so and I, 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 found, I always found it hard to listen to him. But if if, if he's yeah. finally got over that and starting to get better at it, then that's that is definitely a good thing. Yeah, I don't like it, he really did. It really did feel like he was super comfortable and. It was almost like, I don't know if it was just the atmosphere of it being there in Queensland and stuff like that. And it just felt like he walked in from having a good time outside, walked into the commentary box, sat down and talked some footy. It was like really jumped out at me. It was really refreshing. And I I really enjoyed it. It was... Uh, maybe, maybe he'd been doing a bit of charity work at the at Bondi. <laughs> this, it's possible. It's possible. <laughs> Man, that charity work, it gets you... Get you right, just right in the zone. Just like, like you feel your heart want to burst out your chest because you're so proud, you know. Yes, um, so, much, so much pride and love. Ah, oh, just the the love, the love oh. that you get. Yeah, for doing all that charity work. Yeah, so charitable. Oh, I could just do some charity <laughs> work right now. Um, all right. What other news? Right, I don't know if there's any other news going on. Oh, there's there's been a few injuries and stuff coming into oh, Origin. Yeah. Um, do the Origin teams get named this week? I th- yeah, I think it's on. Well, I don't know if, when they do Monday or or I don't know if it's Sunday, Monday or Tuesday. But I, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's after this round of games. Um, and you know we'll hear the typical whinging from fucking New South Wales officials that the Queensland officials wait before the and it's like, oh my goodness, are we still doing this shit? Yeah, like it matters. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, so many injuries, which sucks. Has nothing to do with the six again rule being out of control. It's nothing to do with that, Andrew. Stop thinking that. But Sorry. so many like lower, like repetitive use injury, hammies and all that sort of stuff, groins, stuff like that. So it sucks Correct. that so many teams have got injury problems. A lot of cramping issues going on as well. Well, yeah, a lot more. It feels like there's a lot more cramping this year, and it's, plays in many different positions too. Like normally, you'd see a fullback or get it, or maybe a one of the soft wingers. I say as a winger, but it's been players from all across the the park getting it. So, mm. they'll have numbers on it. They'll they'll have literally have raw data that correlates. So it'll be interesting to see if we see a change there. So, well, should we look at the upcoming games this week? Yeah, let's with do a, it. With a few stats. Yes. All right. First up, we've got Bulldogs versus Dragons. Um, six of the last nine games between these sides have seen the victor win by a margin of 20 points or more. Oh, um, wow. The Dragons have won just five of their last 21 games, 21 games at a core stadium, which goes back to round nine, 2015. While the Bulldogs have won five of their last nine games, which is since round 12 last year. I'm going for the Bulldogs in this one. I think they're, they're just a different level of team to the Dragons, even though the Dragons are – I think the Dragons are above them on the ladder. Um, yeah, the Dragons are ninth, mm. but the Bulldogs' defence has really, really improved in the last, like, month. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I, I like the look of what they're doing. They, they're not – like, they might sneak into the finals if a couple of teams ahead of them, like, fall off the wagon, but – 
Just the fact that they we, you could even say something like that is a million miles from where they've been. So Bulldogs fans are pretty happy about that. Should we say that they're playing good ball or field ball? <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I'm going to go with the Bulldogs to win this okay. comfortably. Yeah, this one. This one's a, it's going to be 70 points either way, pick it. I, well, I've got some stats for this one. Okay, so Cowboys okay. Tigers. Seven of the last nine games for these sides have seen at least 48 total points scored for the match. The other two games had 40 points and 32 points scored. So the score was going to get it working. Um, now, in the last 173 minutes of game time between these two sides, they've scored 175 points. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, it's not horribly lopsided. The Cowboys have got 101 points on the Tigers, 74. He's it, it, nuts. It, isn't it like they had the biggest, they had the biggest difference between score lines in games within a year last yeah. year? Yes, yeah, so it, it was the biggest turnaround. Yeah. In results in, in one year between two, the same two opponents. And it's I by, would, a, it's by an absolute fucking mile. Yeah, it's ridiculous. The would, Tigers won the first game 66 18, and then the Cowboys won six weeks later 74 0. I would love to see it switch back the other way so we continue this, but <coughs> um, unfortunately, I don't think we'll see that. Um, no, the Tigers, the Tigers attack has been um, very, very poor all year. Their defense yeah. is a lot, a lot more stubborn. Yeah. Um, even when they're being outplayed, they're still not getting flogged. So I will pick the Cowboys to win this one, probably like 24-12 or something like that. It seems to be a consistent score for the Tigers, something around that region. Yeah, I'm picking the the Cowboys. If the Cowboys lost this one, the coach might be sacked. Like, they're, it, it's in a real rough point for them. Like, they they should be way better. They've got the talent. Like, yeah. something's wrong there. Because they've got the talent, they're like a top six team talent wise. So for them to be this inconsistent and this poor defensively, especially, um, I think the coach is under pressure. But I think a, like a loss to the West Tigers would be like a hammer blow. Um, but I, I expect them to win. I wouldn't be shocked if they put forty on the the Tigers, but they they're inconsistent. Like they're almost as inconsistent as the Titans. Yeah, but better at slightly more consistent of getting the win anyway. Yeah, well they've got they've got way better talent, so yes. they've just got no excuses to be where they are right now. No, that's true. Um, Manly versus Melbourne, and Manly scored 163 points in their last five games of Brookvale, which is 32.6 points per game. And Melbourne have won 11 of their last 15 games against Manly. But I think like, Melbourne will come into this game without Munster. Yeah, Munster's gone for, I think, eight weeks, eight to ten weeks, yeah. something like that. Really bad he's groin issue. Lengthy time. Yeah. Um, he's going to miss Origin, too. That's right. And this is being played at Brooks Vale Oval, so um, I'll go with Manly by 50. What do we know about the ground there, Andrew? The ground is sour. <laughs> sour. I am going... They should, they should actually move this game to North Sydney Oval, let's be honest. Well, they, they've got 200,000 fans in North Sydney, so they could capitalise on that. Um, I'm Even though the Storm are missing a lot of players, I'm still going to go with the Storm because they're like... They're kind of like the Terminator. They just keep coming at you. All right, That's next. what she said. That's right. The next, um, the match that I labelled as the Battle of Mid. <laughs> Raiders versus the Roosters. Um, uh, I've I've got a wordy stat here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna read it out. Okay. But I'm almost certain it won't make sense. Okay. All right. So I'm going to blame my old age on that. Okay. You are 59. Oh, that's right. The last time the Raiders were at GI Stadium and were kept trialless, it was by the Sharks. It was just the seventh time they've been kept trialless at GI Stadium since 1990. Every time that they've been kept trialless at GIO Stadium. The following game, they've recorded a win. Every single time, except for one occasion, on that one occasion, it was a draw. So they've never lost after being kept scoreless. Or trialless, okay. sorry. Okay. Um, 
Canberra have also won 10 of their last 14 games at Geo Stadium against the Roosters, and that goes back to 2005. So I'm going for Canberra to put 50 on the Roosters here. Um, <clears throat> As you can tell, I'm very fair and balanced in my tipping. <laughs> I am going to go... This is a tough one because they're, they're kind of the same level of team. I'm I'm probably going to go the Roosters just, and I'm going to put it down to, I think Jordan Rapana will be the difference, and I don't mean that in a good way. <laughs> oh, I knew that straight away. Um, <laughs> the next is Sharks versus Panthers. Now, I, I wanted to put a stat out here because the media were hanging shit on Cronulla about this all last year, Hang and on. it's an area that they've obviously worked hard on this year. Okay, so... Cronulla have won all five games against top eight sides this year at the time of, that the game was played. And it's six if you want to include their first round win against the Warriors because they finished fourth in 2023. Mm-hmm. Sharks have now won seven straight games, their longest win streak since their run of 15 wins in 2016. However, was Penrith have the, gone... Uh, was, that the, was that the year? The legit year, yeah. <laughs> the, <laughs> hang on, I'm not talking about the 90s, Andrew. I'm talking about... Yeah, it's it's the legit year. No, I'm not talking about legit. I'm not talking about the 90s and now. I'm talking about, like, you know, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the legit year. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not talking about the 90s or before Flanagan or after Flanagan. It, it was, it was, yeah, it's that one. <laughs> Everything was above board and perfectly fine. Yeah. Everything was normal. Nothing, nothing to see here. When you went nothing, into the pub, nothing said, to see here. Stop fucking looking. <laughs> when you walked into the change rooms and you said, "Is anything weird going on here?" The captain would look at you and say, "Nay." <laughs> um, now Penrith have dominated the recent head-to-head, winning six of the last seven games and keeping the Sharks scoreless twice. <sighs> Racking up an average scoreline of 33 to 12. Uh, this, I, I do suggest and think mm-hmm. that this game will be pretty good to watch. It's going to make up for the battle of mid. Mm-hmm. And it's going to make up for the game that comes on after this. It's going to be a very good game in my view. Yeah, it's, it's going to, I think we're going to learn some stuff out of this game. Um, the Panthers have, the, the, I've been talking about this with Nadine a little bit. They haven't really had a full game where they've looked really good throughout. They've had patches. They've had that typical thing where they get the job done and switch off. They've had some really bad patches, which we haven't seen for a long time. They've had disappointing moments. Um, They feel like they're there for the taking if the Sharks are legit. And I feel like it, like if the Sharks got a win here, it would be a big feather in their cap. But if I feel like if they lost this one, it would be a bit of a blow because the Panthers are there to be taken. Does that make sense? Kind of, kind of. Um, like, I think the Panthers are beatable in this game by the Sharks. And you know I haven't rated the Sharks, but yeah. I was really impressed with what they did last week. Really, really impressed. Their, and it's, their attack hasn't been, the Sharks' attack hasn't been as good as it was in the last few years. However, what we saw last week was it doesn't matter what a team does to them. And the Roosters aren't exactly a crap side when it comes to attack. Hmm. Defensively, not so good. Hmm. I mean, their attack is better than their defense. They can put on a score. We've seen that already a few times this year. And so even when the Roosters are putting on tries, the Sharks were still able to outscore them. Mm-hmm. The thing that was disappointing for the Sharks last week was their defense. The last time their defense led in that many points was against the Tigers at the start of the season where they lost that game horribly. And what happened after that is they improved their defense remarkably. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I've got a feeling that letting in 30 points last week is probably a bit of a kick in their bum to their defensive side and they might be turning up very defensively minded against the Panthers. So I'm not expecting a lot of points in this game. 
Um, and both sides are going to be working their absolute asses up to try and score points. I'm expecting this one to be very tight, and I don't know who's going to win. Yeah, I'd I'd like, just, I'd like, <laughs> as you said, like Penrith haven't been, they haven't even been, I don't even think they've been running it at 80% yet. No, no. They've been coasting. But yeah, and- there's a problem of sometimes you can coast for too long and you forget how to find that next gear. And exactly. They're very close to getting to that point where they either find that next gear or they continue coasting. And if it's not this game, it'll be like a week or two later. And yeah, it'll be and- during Origin that they, they pull their finger out and do something or yeah. they start to slide down the ladder. I don't think they'll slide down the ladder, though. No, um, no, I don't think they will either. I, th- I think that they're kind of trying to – I think that there's – I'm ho- maybe I'm hoping that they're kind of – they know that they can tread water and be a top four team and then put their their game face on in the last, say, third of the season and be ready for the finals. Um, but – and I think this time last year we maybe had similar thoughts about them, maybe not to this extent, but kind of similar area where we're like, you know, the Panthers are not really impressing us just yet and we saw what happened there. I think last year, though, at this point of, this point of the year, their defense was still impeccable. Whereas, yeah. like, it's not, it's not crap or gone horribly bad. It's just a, a slight bit not as good as it was last year. It's still elite. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Um, um but, but they're not quite hitting their straps in attack. No. And, and like, you can understand that with the injuries that they've got. No clearing. Exactly. Stuff like exactly. that. I, and I, I, don't like some of their selections. Like I'd keep Luai at five eighth, and I'd bring in a, a halfback. I know that Snyder's injured, but you know, you, I, I'd be looking. I'd actually be looking to bring in a halfback to the club from maybe another club at the moment. That's where I'd be looking at. But um, there's also that thing about Penrith, and we've seen in little patches here and there this season where, and, and I, there was a set they had against South Sydney, and I know South sucks. But there was a set where they pinned Souths on their line and Souths didn't make 10 metres. Like, they kept them on their line for the full set. And so they've still got that in them. Like, they've still got that ridiculous, like, it's. and when they get into that sort of mode, it's almost like... like and it's weird because it, it's in games where you're like, oh, the Panthers are sort of all right, they're all right. Oh, my God, what am I watching happen? You know, it's sort of that sort of level of football, they can pull that out in patches. And you wonder if they, when are they going to do that in the whole game? Yeah. And that's, that's what you think about this game. It's like, a Penrith going to turn up after a loss last week? The Sharks are high. They're, they're feeling good. They're on top of the ladder. And then they run into Penrith and it's like, oh, fuck. Penrith just put down a marker. That's the worry for the Sharks side. Of course, of course. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm not too sure should I go on this. I'll I'll go out on a limb and say Sharks to win fourteen twelve. My first instinct is to pick the Sharks, but I'm gonna pick the Panthers because if I pick the Panthers in every game I'm gonna be right in most of them. Well that's true. You know. And I you know what I'm relying on is that almost that institutional knowledge of like they're not in, the Panthers are not in good form. They've got injuries, but I'm kind of picking them on the thing of like they're gonna. It's a big game. Sharks are up for it, and I hope that they sort of come out and say, "Settle down." We're the Panthers. That's what I'm hoping for. Oh. So arrogant, hey? Absolutely. Fucking nerve. <laughs> <laughs> um. Right, the next game: struggling Cellar City. Rabbitohs versus the Eels. Yeah, the battle of the interim coaches. <laughs> Souths have won just one of their last 12 games, conceding 403 points at 33.6 per game. Oh, my God. Parramatta have won one of their last seven games and conceded 232 points at 33.1 points per game. Half a point that's, per game were, are better, but not by much. That's, um, that's the other start. I mean, they're starting to look at historic levels, aren't they, of just well, terrible ones. After just 10 games this year, they've conceded 348 points. Only five teams in the history of the competition have conceded more points across their opening 10 games. Jesus. The, the Bulldogs in 35 with 393 points. Yeah. 
University in 1920, 371 points. The Cowboys in 96, 360 points. The Knights in 2016, 355. And University in 1935 for 350. The Cowboys basi- in 2002 also considered 348. You're basically naming like a bunch of the all-time worst teams. Well, outs- notice that West 1999 are in that group. I was about to say, except for West, yeah. Yeah. Or Canberra in 82, and they were pretty bloody horrible as well. Yeah. Um, That's bad. Now, in 2024, South have been getting off to horrible starts. They've tried at halftime in all 10 games, scoring just 64 points and conceding 166. That's just in the first half. They've outperformed their opponents just twice in the second half and have scored 34 more points than in the first half, but have conceded another 16 points more. Their defense is just dog shit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the Eels, they've conceded um, 215 points in their last six games, which is 35.8. Jesus. <clears throat> and it, it pretty much all went downhill for them at halftime in round seven against the Dolphins. They were up 8-4 at that game at halftime, mm-hmm. and then they lost 44-16. That was a, was that the one in uh, Darwin? Yes. Yeah, I, I, yeah, because that game stood out for me because of that. It was like, uh, it was like, what the fuck just happened? You know what I mean? They were, they were struggling, but still within touch of the top eight. Mm. So they were just, they just needed like two good games in a row, and they would have been back in the top eight, and the confidence and whatnot from there would have helped them get along and start building a bit of momentum. But they come out of the sheds at halftime there. It got absolutely flogged, led in 40 points in 40 minutes, and they have been dog shit since, and now mm. they've sacked their coach. The thing that – the thing – this it, it's a weird reaction that I'm having to their terrible run. It makes me think more and more every week of Mitch Moses. I, I, I don't know if that's the right reaction to have, but when he was out there for them even this year, they were they were going all right. You know, they weren't setting the world on fire, but they were all right. Yeah. And then he, when he's not in the team, it's like they have zero chance, basically, against any half-decent team even. Um, I cannot wait to see when he comes back how they're going to go. Because if they, if he comes back and they're just average, that's huge for him. Like, it would be, I'd, I'd be really shocked. I've never thought of him as that sort of player, but... He might be. I'm not saying he's a superstar or anything. I think I think we both sort of have expressed how we feel about Moses as a player. He's, he's all right, but he's not that sort of level of halfback. But that he's the level of halfback where if he's not there, your te- this Eels team is completely stuffed. I think that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I kind of hope that the Eels put 60 points on because I am here for the Trent Barrett five-year deal. <laughs> I I think Latrell Mitchell will be better for the run last week. Mm-hmm. And with how, how bad Parramatta are in the second half at the moment, I wouldn't be surprised if South win by 20. Oh, wow. Wow, you're going the other way. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going all in on the big the big calls this week. Yeah, wow, that's just, interesting. I'm just out there every game, nuts on the line. <laughs> <laughs> and seriously, Andrew, what a pair of nuts. Ah, please, mate, I've got plenty to put on the line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. 59 years worth is what I've got. <laughs> oh, man. Um, so who, you're going Parramatta? Yeah, I'm going, Param- I'm going Parramatta. I, I think that they'll... I think that they'll look pretty good, but it, it's going to be tempered by the fact that it is against Souths. Yes. All right, next game is the Broncos versus the Titans. Um, Brisbane have won 36 of their 49 games against all Gold Coast-based sides, and Jesus. 17 of those wins have come from the 22 times they've played them at Suncorp. And the Titans have won just four of their last 20 NRL games. It sounds worse than it is not really. Um, I Look, I, I absolutely love watching the Broncos play. 
I, I think it's great seeing Madden in at halfback. He, he's just, he, I, I don't know what it has been about his career, but he just looks like he's found his place and they need to stick with him and, and with an eye and just keeping him there when Reynolds comes back, in my opinion. Um, I think that they're going to put it to the Titans. Yep. Broncos is by 50. Yeah, I wouldn't be shocked by that. Um, the, by the, the Broncos forward yeah. pack, can I just say, and it's a big call, might might be equal with Penrith. They are I, impressive. Yeah, they're just, in attack and defense, mm-hmm. I, I'm watching them and I'm like, oh, man, this is fucking amazing. I, I can't give them Penrith's title until they beat the title, you know, until they yeah. beat the champions. But right now, I'm looking at this Broncos team and I'm like, this pack is something else. It certainly is. Uh, last game, Warriors versus Dolphins. So all of the four games played at uh, Mount Smart Stadium this year have been decided by eight points or less. And the Dolphins have won eight of their last 11 games. Turn corner. Yeah. Okay, so for this one, it was really impre- really impressive win last week by the Warriors over the Panthers. Um, had a chance to let the Panthers win and didn't. They come back and won it, which was a great sign for them. The going back, it's going to be a full house, and I'm just going to rely on the thing of like, man, the Warriors were disappointing. So I'm going for the for the Dolphins. I think that the Warriors will be will all be waiting for this big thing for the Warriors, and it's just going to fall a bit flat. And I think that the Dolphins will win. Okay, I'll go Warriors by twenty. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I'm just I'm just going big margins all game except for yeah. except for the battle at the top. Yeah, yeah, that seems fair. Look, the that's the Tigers are going to make a game of it because they don't have Bateman to uh, hold them back. And Bateman's so bad. He's He's atrocious. It's just like... For, I, for many, many years, I would have argued that Adam Blair was the worst signing the Tigers ever made. Mm-hmm. I'm doubting that now. Yeah. Uh, a worse... I'm trying to think of a worse signing. I mean, Blair... The thing about Blair was, like, he he come in on big money. He'd been at the Storm. He'd played pretty well for them. Well, it's more just, too that the Tigers lost Bryce Gibbs and a very young Andrew Fafita in order to get Blair. Yeah. And those two players went to the Sharks, and one of them won a premiership. Yeah. And the Tigers went downhill further. Yeah, and he just – he like, he literally looked like he just didn't care, hmm. um, which was interesting. I think and, I and watched him. What, Sorry, and, and to try and, try and label someone as the worst Tiger signing ever – yeah. You've got to realise how much area that takes in. There's yeah, a lot. Yeah. There's a lot of signings that the Tigers have made over a long period of time, and many of them bad. Like, uh, Matt, even, Matt the good ones, uh, even the good ones are like, uh, yeah, he's probably still a first grader. <laughs> <laughs> Matt Ballon, we got him after he played Origin. Oh, you know what? It's hard to beat him, though, because you got but, Matt Ballin. You got in Matt Ballin from the Seagulls, and, like, I think he played four minutes, didn't he? I was about, no, he played, um, I think I calculated, it was about 58 minutes all up. He played over three years. Okay. Yeah. Because he got, I remember he got injured really early in his first game, and it was like an ACL. It was a terrible one. Yes. Uh, and, and yeah. He never yeah. played a full 80-minute game for the Tigers. Every game was... Um, he either got injured or he came off the bench and didn't play the full game. But yeah, there, there's been a lot of a lot of uh, not so great signings by the club. You so, know, what? I'm I'm sitting here right, and I'm thinking to myself, Matt Ballon basically didn't play for the club at all, right? Yeah. Basically, yeah. Is that really worse than Bateman? And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, oh, I think it might be, and I. But See, I don't know. That's the thing. I don't know. Bateman, because Bateman is negatively affecting them yeah. every single game he plays. That's right. Like, if Bateman wasn't playing, it would be a, a good thing for them. I mean, he also did the Tigers sign um, Ryan O'Hara. 
Oh, that was a pretty bad one. Yep. Um, oh, I'm trying to think who else that was. Jason Kalis. I think, yeah, because, yeah, that was, a, that was a pretty bad one. But he was like, yeah. that's a, a, a very, very perfect example of like, yeah, he was probably a first grader, you know? Yeah. Ooh, ooh, Joel Reddy. Oh man. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and also it, it, following the year after Joel Reddy, we'd had the, um, the triple signings of Braith and Nasta, Eddie Pettiborn and Bodine Thompson. I can't even remember Bodine Thompson playing for them. Mate. Oh yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, um, what's his, what was his name? He just said, um, oh, the fullback. Um, I've already forgot his name, hey? Joel, Joel Reddy. Joel Reddy. That was, that was immediately catastrophic. Mm. That's the thing about that one where like they got him as the fullback and it was like, oh, this is like Paul Carriage every game bad. Yeah, he was, he was, he was just wrong. Yeah. Uh, um, Keith Lulia, Corey Patterson. Um, Corey Patterson Kevin. was a bad one. Kevin Naguama, he was more more bad than good at the Tigers. Um, yeah, Matt Ballon. Tim Grant. Ooh, he was a bad one. He got Jordan, still, like they literally got zero out of him. Jordan Rankin. <laughs> we might have a winner. <laughs> uh, Jamal Idris. Oh, I forgot about Jamal Idris, yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, man. This was the Chris McQueen. Yeah, I think he's Josh still Reynolds. playing over. He's still playing over in England, hi. Huh? Yeah, I think he's at Huddersfield. Oh, he might have been um, another club. He was in over there. Yeah, Josh, Josh Reynolds. Reynolds. Yeah, he's got to be right up there. He's in the final. Yeah. Um, oh boy, who else was there? Um, Joey Lalua. <laughs> yeah, he's another Ooh. one that's in the Oh boy. <laughs> that's rough. That's a really rough. <laughs> Man, there's some bad memories coming back now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, it gets with James Roberts. Oh, yeah, he was a shocker. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yeah, James, like James. Oh, man, Oliver Gildart. Oh, I think he wins. <laughs> I think he wins. We're, okay, here's the difference between all of the others we've talked about and him, right? The others, it's like, oh, he's probably a first grader. Oliver Gildart, it was like, oh, this guy it would struggle in Ron Massey Carp. Yeah. He was... Fucking terrible. Yeah. Well, Bateman's in the same area because he hasn't played a good game yet for the Tigers. No, he hasn't. He hasn't. But the th- I think the thing with Gildart was like he was undersized and he like he made fucking Crocker look like a defensive genius. <laughs> like he couldn't he couldn't tackle anything. But he didn't really jump Bateman though. Look, he's screwed. He's, he's He's just on six foot tall and 96 kilos playing in the second row at the age of 30. That's a good point. That's a good point. He's, what, four or five inches taller than Luke Brooks and about six kilos heavier than him. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not fucking kidding. That's probably very close to accurate. I would I rather... Luke Brooks is, I think Luke Brooks is 176 centimetres and, and 88 or 90 kilos. I would rather Luke Brooks playing in second my row. forward pack. Yeah, I'd rather then, Luke Brooks in second row than Bateman. Yeah, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Manly, can we have him back or swap? <laughs> you can have Bateman be your five eight. I mean, I'm I'm not up on the like Luke Brooks is playing having an amazing season at Manly. I think he's just going okay. He's like not, he's not he's, he's not he's terrible. He's doing everything I said that would happen, and that was you take the pressure of organising the team away from him and let him play his natural game. And he'll be perfectly fine. Hmm. 
And that's exactly what he's doing. He's, he's always had the skill set. I've said that all along. He's always had the skills. He's never had the organizing ability and the communication. And that was the one thing you must have down pat if you're going to be a long-term halfback and a successful one. That's it. I mean, Chad Townsend is a good example. He doesn't really, he doesn't have the skill set that Luke Brooks has. No, no. But he's out there talking and communicating with his team. And that's yeah. why he's got a premiership next to a name and Luke Brooks has got fucking nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Very right? good. That's just, it's as simple as that. So that's very well put. Um, yeah, with, with DC doing all of that, Brooks is, Brooks has come along and he's taken some of the, some of the pressure off DCE. So it's helped DC play good footy. Um, cause Brooks can, he's got a reliable enough kicking game. He's got a very good passing game. Um, and if the plays are organized around him, he'll hit those runners all day long and he has been. Mm. So it's the perfect team for him to go to. It's the best decision he's made in his entire career was to go to Manly. Uh, by the way, uh, former, former West Tigers winger who was, uh, should have been an origin contention if you asked him. What was his name? Oh, that legend the wing, uh, David Nofaluma. David Nofaluma. I, I think that it's already over for him in England, hey? It's, it's funny. Someone's, someone was complaining for Salford about, you know, why did we sign this bloke in the first place? And they've, they've mm. dumped him after, what was it, six months or three months, whatever it was. Mm. Mm. And I said, you know what? You could complain about why did the club sign him, but at least your club sacked him yes. after four months. Yeah. You could have done what another team did, and then I just took a screen, screen grab of his entire career at the West Tigers. And look how many <laughs> years he was there. He even, he even went out the door to Melbourne and he was happy to stay there and we brought him back. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like <coughs> big contract extensions too. Like 400 grand a year. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, it, it's <sighs> what, what must it be like for a dude like that who, and we've talked about how, um, how sometimes a player can can get ahead of themselves, and he definitely did that, right? But it must be very strange for him to think of himself as the way he did at the West Tigers, right? Then he goes down to the Storm and feels as though he did something pretty special there. Once to stay there, comes back to the Tigers, feels like he's still the man, eventually tries to do a little bit of, like almost senior player sort of stuff with the club, and the club says, see you later. Says, well, see you later. You'll be missing me, right? And then he goes over to – he can only get a job in England, goes over there, and it's all over after a few months. Like, he must be in a really interesting spot with where he feels his career is, and I wonder what he does now. Like, you know where the best place for him would be to go is Penrith. As, as what? But as a poker machine attendant? Just <laughs> no, I'm just saying, just drive through Penn. <laughs> <laughs> just that, it's a nice place. I'm just saying it'd be nice for him to go. Um, a, re- a real estate agent in Ropes Creek. Check out, check out the, uh, check out the Nepean River. Uh, maybe have a nice afternoon walk down the river. That's all I'm saying. No, I, I think that T- ticket inspector at Penn's train station. Maybe it would be good. Like, and look, I'm not even talking about first grade. He's not a first grader. And in, he's, he's not a super league level player. Well, yeah, and he's proven that. But like physically, you know, he can play at NRL level, like just pure physically, like as a human mm. being, right? And it, it's the other stuff that he has a problem with: the catching, the passing, it, <laughs> the reading, defense. Oh, when the ball he... gen- when the ball generally comes in his direction. <laughs> Apart from that, though, when you you put all of that aside, like as a as like a you know a human being, he can physically be there out on the field. I wonder if going to the Penrith lower grades and and going there in a humble way and saying I've got a problem and I I need it I need somebody to coach it out of me. I wonder if you could get something out of it. No, and, and that's not, what not, I would be looking at if I was him. Not now. He's I think age is not on his side. How old is he now? Like twenty eight? Oh, surely he's 
Surely he's close to 30 now. Let's have a look. I mean, obviously you'll be spot on. No, he's 30. He turned 30 last November. Yeah, that's that's rough. Yeah, he that's from, really rough. He is, he is from Newcastle. <laughs> Don't say that. Don't do that to me. Hey, hey, Adam, Adam, you need a winger, mate. Don't do that to them. They've been through enough. Come on, he just wants two games to get to 200 in his career. That would be nice. Back at his, uh, back at home. But yeah, go home. Go home for two games. He got to 100 tries for the Tigers. But he's, he's ticked that off the list. They already have to deal with having Jackson Hastings in their team. Don't, don't hurt them more. He can, just two games. Just give him two games. Let him get his 200 and he can play it for his home, his home area. Towards the end of the year. Yeah. And then he calls yeah. it a retirement. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. Actually, no, just give him one game. <laughs> <laughs> you bastard. Put him on the bench for the rest of the year, but don't activate him. Imagine if... <laughs> imagine if <laughs> I'm just going to cruel shit now. <laughs> he signs for them on a clause where he's only going to play two games, and that's it. He's going to retire, and they just name him 18th man. <laughs> <laughs> they give him one game and then the rest of it is just 18th man. And then the, at the last game of the year, they put him on the 17th and then he stays on the bench and they don't use the 17th man. They just use 16 players. Yeah. yeah they oh, sorry, a... David didn't see you down there, mate. Yeah. <laughs> they they say, we'll give you two games. Our season's over, we'll give you the two games and then he plays one game the next game. They say, dude, we cannot play you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh shit. Um, I don't think an NRL team will even look at him. Um, his only opportunity now is, I mean, he's in England, stay there yeah. and look, look in, uh, League One or Championship. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, he'll absolutely dominate in League One over there. Yeah. Cause of the physicality and, and, thing. And he'll, he'll play as a fullback. Yeah. You know, the thing is, that when, look, when <coughs> when Super League coaches take a couple of weeks and work you out, that says a lot. Because Super League coaches are fucked. Oh, boy. I heard someone suggesting that maybe Parramatta should be looking at a Super League coach. Went, yeah. Yeah. Well, it'll be an upgrade on Trey Barrett, but not much. <laughs> <laughs> I always find it funny when... Like they'll say, oh, here's the list of coaches, and then they they they're like Steve McNamara. And it's like, <laughs> do you fucking people have any idea how bad of a coach Steve McNamara is? Well, the other thing I saw in there was um, someone said, no, what we need is a clean out from head to toe. Yeah. Oh, I know of a CEO and a um, chairman of a board that's currently looking for a job. <laughs> they would take the club down to its bare minimum. <laughs> You just got sometimes, to put up with twelve years of it. That's all. Sometimes you need to hit rock bottom before you hit rock bottom again and again <laughs> and again and again and again. There's no plan to get off rock bottom. It's just you know, let's get to rock bottom first and then profit. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious, eh? Oh well. Look, on that note, we should probably wrap this one up. We've given Paramount fans a hell of a hell of a lot of misery today. Um, yeah. I mean. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> Look, the the only thing I want to say left for Parramatta is that Brad Arthur has been very classy in the way he's handled the sack. Oh, he really has. He really has. Super, super classy. And I, like I saw a quote from him today, and I'm paraphrasing now, but he basically said, like, if you had have told me that I'd get to coach Parramatta for like 12 years or whatever it's been, I'd get to take them to a grand final. I'd get to see my son make his first grade debut in the team I was coaching. And then I got sacked. I would take that every day. And it, it's it, like he, he's been such a class act after it. And um, I think that's a measure of who he is as a person. And evidence that he was not the problem. Yeah, I yeah, he he, he was definitely... They had. We've talked about their issues for a number of years now, and I, I know you and me don't think he's the best coach in the league. Um, but it, like he he wasn't the first problem to fix. There's no doubt about that. I don't know. They're, 
their their roster management was always always worrying in the last few seasons, and that's not all on him. Isn't that uh, Mark O'Neill? It probably is actually. Yeah. Is that the same Mark O'Neill that was at the West Tigers? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, there you go. I did. Well, while you've got some West Tigers people there, there's a few other ones that can come along. One of them can <laughs> even be your major sponsor. Everything's peachy, para. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, well. On that note, uh, thanks for tuning in. Make sure you check us out on all the socials. Like and subscribe to us on YouTube. That'd be brilliant. And we will catch us all next time.